Hey everybody, it is Thursday, which means that it is time for another episode of Bad Writing. I'm your host, Matthew Kadish, coming at you from the Salty Nerd Podcast, as always. So real quick, everyone, just uh, be sure to like, subscribe if you're not already subscribed to the channel. Uh, let us know uh, in the chat what you think of these things. Uh, if you're watching after the fact, uh, be sure to leave us a super thanks. We always respond to those. And if you're watching during the broadcasting stream, if you have a question from one of our expert panelists, don't be afraid to throw us a super chat. We always prioritize those. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the, the Netflix TV show, which is a South Korean import called Squid Games. So big spoilers uh, ahead. So if you haven't seen the show and you don't want it spoiled for you, don't watch this. Go watch the show. Come back. Watch the replay because we are going to be talking about this thing in depth. And we're going to be breaking it down. And with me to break it down are my expert panel of experts. Uh, so uh, I'll just go go around uh, this way, I guess. Uh, so uh, to my uh, right here is Stephen Ladd. And Steve is a really good old buddy of mine. He's a, Uf a USC film school graduate. And he was also a screenwriter in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, we'd sit for multiple hours late at night at various diners talking about movie ideas and screenwriting and stuff like that. So uh, I love this guy to death. He's one of my best friends. And uh, he's a very good writer. So, Steve, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and your experience and what makes you qualify to talk about writing? Hi. Well, um, uh, hi. Um, again, I'm Stephen Ladd. I was... Uh, uh, class of 96, uh, USC film, uh, CNTV grad, which is now a different name. I'm not sure exactly what, but I spent 25 years in Hollywood working, uh, in various capacities as a writer. I did a lot of rewriting for people. Uh, I did a lot of work on, uh, various television shows and, and films. And, uh, yeah, I just, have always been a student, uh, worked, outside of Hollywood too, uh, s several different projects, including one very dear to my heart about a, a, a Native American named Quanta Parker. And uh, it didn't get off the ground, unfortunately, but it's uh, it's still a good learning lesson and uh, very uh, a lot of experience. And a lot of time, like Matt said, breaking down film, television, really digging at the heart of it. And that's what, you know, that's what we love to do. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. All right. And to my bottom here is uh, Mr. Richard Fox, uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, some of you may know Richard. He's a best-selling author. He's written the Ember War series, and the latest series is the Tear series. And he's also collaborated with uh, the legendary David Weber, who did the Honor Harrington series. And they, they've been working on a book called Ascent to Empire. Uh, Richard, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're so awesome? Hi, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I am a full-time writer. I mostly write space opera, science fiction. I've dabbled a little bit in multi-history. And uh, once upon a time, I tried to be a screenwriter. And I realized it's really hard to sell anything in Hollywood. So I switched to writing novels. And that worked out a lot easier for me. So. And um, also, I, I lived in Korea. I was in the United States Army. I, I did two tours in Korea. And so I... I, I been exposed to the culture of a squid game a little bit more than I think the uh, the average bear. So I can enjoy talking about that. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I really enjoy squid game. I'm so happy to talk about something that was good for a change. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny, guys, because uh, I contacted Richard and begged him to come back on the show because he's been on here once before. And I was like, we can talk about whatever you want. You, you choose. He's like, I want to talk about squid games. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I just finished watching that. So let's go ahead and do it. So uh, typically we have three panelists and our third panelist, he's running a little bit late, but he's going to be here in a little bit. And that will be uh, Chris Coles, a.k.a. Mr. Reagan. So you guys have seen Mr. Reagan on the on the show before, and he always has some really good stuff. And he's very excited to talk about this show. So when he hops in, we'll take a little bit of a break. We'll let him introduce himself, and then we'll get right into it. And I just want to remind everyone that if you uh, want to throw some super chats our way, any support is appreciated. But we will um, work those into the discussion, whereas the regular chats, if they're any worth mentioning, we'll do that at the end of the show. All right, guys, so let's talk about our first discussion point here, which is making unlikable characters likable. Now, one of the things that struck me about Squid Games is that the first two episodes are kind of like an introduction 
to the characters that we're going to be following for all all nine episodes. I believe it was nine. Um, and uh, so, like, we have our main character, uh, number four, five, six. I think forty six. Uh, I believe. No, it, it was it was three digits. It was four, oh, five, four, six. Yeah, four, five, six. I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. Uh, I can't pronounce his actual name, so I'm just going to call him four fifty six. Um, Jihan, is that how, how yeah. you pronounce it? Okay, so so he's kind of like our main focused character, and he is one of the most despicable human beings I think I've ever seen on on screen. At least in the first like two episodes, like he steals money from his invalid mother who's supporting him. He's kind of leeching off her. He's like a deadbeat dad. He owes people money. Like it's just like he he's a terrible, horrible character. And we meet various other characters that become part of the ensemble in, in these first two episodes. And all of them are horrible. They're, they're the most despicable characters ever. And yet by the time you get to episode nine, you've come to care for every single one of these miserable, despicable, horrible characters, especially uh, Gihan, Gihan? Yeah. 456, whatever. Um, and so what I wanted to ask you guys is, how, like, what is the technique of, number one, creating a despicable character that the audience is intentionally supposed to dislike, and then taking them on an arc to the point where the audience actually cares for them and is invested in them actually succeeding within the context of the story? Richard, why don't we start with you on this one? Thank you. Um, yeah, I was watch when I was watching the first episode, I uh, was watching Gihan, and we, we went through all the things that we talked about. And, I, and I, when they got to the point where they're done introducing him, where we saw just about everything that we need to know about his mother, his relationship with his daughter, his horrible gambling habit, it was about, I think it was 11 minutes. It took 11 minutes of screen time for us to really get to know Gihan. And I was like, that's pretty impressive. So we knew, you know, and, and you know, I think for everyone out there, we know what makes someone despicable. We, we've all met people like this. So it's really how we, you know, just present someone as someone we don't like not too difficult, but then how do you get the audience to go, okay, I'll spend nine episodes with this person. I think is a scumbag. That's where it starts to get a little harder. And I was kind of surprised that this actually happened in the show. And Steve, I, I think both of you would know about this because there's a very famous book in screenwriting circles called yeah. save the cat Indeed. by Sitfield. Is that right? Uh, so something like that. Blake Snyder, actually. Blake, Blake Snyder. Snyder. I, get, I always get them confused. So there's, there's a thing where Blake Snyder says, if you want your, audience to really like a character you have him save a cat you know because that's the altruistic sort of thing to do is like you don't have to save a cat it's not your cat you can just save a cat and then the character and then the audience is gonna be like oh he's a nice guy he went out and saved a cat well what does gihan do he feeds a cat he gets he get, you know his <laughs> friends he, he gets some free fish from a lady and he's walking home and he sees a hungry cat and he feeds the cat and i'm like little on the nose but <laughs> yeah. i I guess that's the point. I mean, I guess he read. He's a he's a fan of Blake Snyder too. But yeah. so you know, we, we can have despicable characters. And I think one thing about this show is that as we saw all these people, you know how despicable they are. You start to realize it's not necessarily by their choice. I mean, for the most part, these were all gambling addicts or people who had, you know, made some really really poor financial decisions. And after a while, you start seeing them and you start to realize, you know what, just about anybody could end up like this. Yeah. And you could end up with an addiction. You could end up, you know, supporting family members. Uh, the one character, the, the one main girl in the series, her name is Kang. She's the North Korean. Uh, we find out later that, you know, she was trying to get her. She's taking care of her brother who she smuggled out of North Korea. She's trying to get her mother out of North Korea. It's like, OK, we can relate to that. So and as the, and as the series goes on. You, you know, these people are put in such awful situations. You start to think, man, this is, this feel bad for these people. They just, they just think they're playing red light, green light. They're getting shot. This is, this is no bueno now. <laughs> How do we, I, they, I want these people not to get shot playing red light, green light. That's a little bit much. So uh, Richard, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, our third panelist has no, showed up. Uh, Mr. Reagan, thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, can you just give us a quick intro and then we'll uh, go back into uh, the discussion? Yeah, sorry to interject here. Uh, my name is Mr. Reagan. I have a channel called Mr. Reagan. My real name is Chris. And uh, well, my show is about politics uh, here on YouTube. So if you're not into politics, uh, just ignore it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I love Squid Game. 
And so I was uh, thrilled to be invited to talk about this and uh, looking forward to the chat and to meeting you two guys. Um, can you quickly so, tell me who these guys are? Yep, yep. Matt. So Chris, so Chris, uh, the gentleman to my right, is one of my best friends. Uh, his name's Stephen Ladd. He's a former screenwriter from Hollywood. And uh, right. yeah, I, I used to spend hours out about Los Angeles with this gentleman, uh, pitching ideas to him and, and reading I his know what stuff that's like. and reading my stuff and all that good, good stuff. Good days, good times. And of course, we have the legendary author Richard Fox with us, uh, author of The Ember War and collaborator with David Weber and uh, other um, you know big writing people. Uh, so what so you're trying to tell me is I'm once again the least qualified, qualified person on yes. the panel. Yeah. <laughs> always, always. I mean, like we need, you here, we need you here as a baseline, Chris. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, so we were talking about how to make unlikable characters likable and how right. the main character, Ji Hun, is, uh, oh. is, is that, did I mangle that name again? I anyway. think we, we, that's close enough. Oh, okay. Okay. Enough. okay. Uh, and how like the opening episode spent 11 minutes just showing how, terrible of a person this he's guy a scoundrel was. Yeah. yeah yeah and and you know when i was watching it i was just like oh my god am i gonna have to sit through nine hours of this you know haven't so, we so... all stolen money from our mother and gambled <laughs> it away though i know uh richard why don't you uh, uh continue on with uh, what you're talking about before uh, chris so rudely interrupted i you did I, I do apologize i was I making apologize. a video that i thought would take a half an hour it took well over an hour and i'm like hurry I gotta finish this stupid thing. I'm like reading the teleprompter like as fast as I can. Anyway, no, sorry. No, Continue, Richard. No problem. But for just the simplest way to, to make you know uh, readers out there to appreciate kind of like a character, show a glimmer that this person is not all scumbag. And if it's if something is saving a cat, and you know, I thought they were going to do that with his daughter, but then we, we we you know when he's going to have a dinner, his birthday dinner with his daughter, and his daughter told him exactly what she, what he wanted, what she wanted, and he gambles all the money away and then when he gets 10,000 won which is about 10 uh, 11 or 12 dollars instead of going out to buying her a, kind of a heartfelt gift what does he do he goes and plays games to try to win again and i'm like oh my gosh and he gets her a gun yeah well yeah, i didn't know like, <laughs> that was that was a great reveal that was <laughs> it was yeah that was but and then it turns out that it's just a gun shaped lighter yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, get, um, get a lighter. <laughs> Smoke yeah, like, like at, at first I thought, like, oh, did the game already start? Like, like what's going on here? <laughs> no, it was just like he's so stupid. He didn't even check the the gift that he got for his daughter, and it was like yeah. a gun lighter. Yeah, it was. Dumb. But as far as getting over that initial, am I going to like this character enough to to stick with the story? Just to show a glimmer to the audience that this guy, this guy's not all bad, and that way you're kind of telling the audience he's going to have an arc. And by the end, you, you you're not going to regret going on this journey with him. That's that's what I would say as a writer. All right. So, Steve, what do you think are the techniques that storytellers can use to not only make a character unlikable, but also start to turn that character around and, and have the audience start to sympathize with them? Wow. There's a there's a lot to unpack. And in, in the case of Squid Game, uh, Gihan, he yeah, he's exactly what we saw. He was a dirtbag. I mean, this is a guy doing all these terrible things and uh you know per what richard said there was a a big moment where we saw him save the cat the glimmer of hope but there's also a context and uh, again to richard's point this was a situation where you felt you could feel the badness it could happen to anyone and we we oftentimes have to ask ourselves what would i do in this situation and one of the big points of the the story and, and the arc is he went from being a victim without any identity and any real purpose. I mean, the guy had a kid worthless to his kid, his want worthless to his mom, worthless to pretty much everyone. He owed everyone money and going, but there was at the same time, he, we saw him that he did have a heart and that's what led us into the story. Now, uh, one of the other techniques to, to that we saw moving forward, and this is uh, very common in a lot of shows, uh, uh, was the technique of he's bad, but we're going to put him up against someone worse. And when we see him against this gangster guy, it's like, okay, he's bad, and but this guy's much worse. Not only that, he's partially responsible for G Gihan's situation because he had the money. If he would have had that money for the, those. Uh, you know those the the loan sharks, I guess whoever they were that he owed, he'd have paid that. You know what? The show would have ended in twenty minutes, but it didn't because he had to go in, 
and he had to stay in. And uh, so that that's a technique right there, bad versus worse, and then bad comparatively to everyone else. Uh, the the North Korean girl, she was just you know nihilist, didn't care. You know what? Why are you talking to me? Why? Are, she was a thief. A real, yeah, thief. You know, in part and also partially responsible for Gihan's situation. So and somewhat sociopathic. Yes, absolutely, and uh, you know somewhat sociopath compared to the gangster who is exactly. fully sociopathic. Yeah. And uh, so the context changed because relative to everyone else in that room that he was with, he he wasn't by far near the worst person. And uh, we've seen this technique happen, or you know, these techniques happen. Uh, also, you, you, he, we pull back on his badness. So as it went, we started seeing this moral you know, moral character step up and this guy's purpose start coming forward. This, uh, they, we pull back on it and these other guys are still boom, boom, boom. Like the gangster, he's never, he was never redeemable. He was a true villain, a really good one. And then even worse are the perpetrators of the game. You know, we're, you know, people using people as basically pawns and uh, for their own amusement. So, I think the idea is you take it, you, you pull back and then let them, you know, in this situation, you start building this empathy over time. Uh, a little a little bit here, a little bit there. It's where finally we're like, yeah, we're identifying with them. And that's another point is, you know, you don't, the character doesn't always have to be likable. They have, we have to be able to identify with them though, on some yeah. level. I think so that's a- kind of, kind of along those lines, um... Chris, I don't know if you've ever read Michael Hogg. He's a kind of a screenplay uh, guru type guy. He goes around and teaches seminars and stuff like that. And uh, I took one of his classes. And one of the things I really got from his class was um, like there are ways in which you can instantly make the audience identify and like or sympathize with the character. And one of those ways is to make them the victim of an undeserved misfortune. Yeah. And every single character that we follow in this show is the victim of an undeserved misfortune. Um, and, and so like that kind of, you know, ingratiates the audience to them initially, but, you know, like everyone else has pointed out, these characters all start off as just like, really like not I, I'm not sure I would agree with that actually. Okay. Undeserved misfortune. I mean, certainly the Indian was the victim of an undeserved misfortune. Yeah. I don't know if any of the other ones were. The other ones well, were seem, I, seemingly I, deserved misfortune, really. Well, the the North Korean girl, she got taken advantage of where she paid someone to get her mother out of North Korea. They stole her money. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the um, smart guy, the stock trader, mm -hmm. you know, um, he basically, um, everyone had these this expectation of him that he couldn't live up to, and he failed because of that. Um there's just there's there's a lot of stuff where these character even the main character uh, to a certain extent, you know he won this money it was the answer to his problems then he got it stolen from him he gets beat up has to sign away his rights all uh, rights to his body all this stuff so I mean like there's there's just little things at play but in your opinion what was the trick in making the audience actually start caring about these characters after two episodes of basically mm -hmm. them just being like the worst people ever yeah I I mean. You could definitely look at it like that. I, did, I didn't. When I was watching it, I felt like, you know, certainly that girl was in a bad situation. But the way she was yeah. trying to solve all of her problems was through, you know, criminality. I mean, she decided to be, you know, you make choices in life. I think a lot of the reason why this show is so compelling and you can relate to these characters, you can identify with them, or not even to identify with them, but you like, like the crazy girl that, like, has sex with a gangster <laughs> because she wants to, you know, be on his team or whatever. She's a very unlikable. I said it's possibly the least likable character on the show, and yet we've all met a girl like that. You know, oh, we've yeah. all met a little bit like a crazy she, person. She was like trying that. to manipulate him. Yeah, yeah. You, you you meet manipulative people. You meet meet kind of crazy people throughout your life. I mean, I'm 42. I've met all kinds of look crazy people, all kinds of different people, and I've met people who everyone on that show reminded me of someone. I mean, they were written yeah. so well, so beautifully, so naturally. Like you would really, you don't do that in Hollywood anymore, right? You always got to make the black lesbian like the most badass character, you know, or something. You know, there's always some kind of virtue signal or something that they're trying to do. And it's, it's like, well, I've never met anybody like that. I don't think that's real. But this show, I mean, these are South Koreans. I, I don't know 
any South Koreans, but I could relate to all those characters. I mean, I've met all those characters in, in my white world in Oregon, you know where I'm from. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I digress. Uh, I, I, I will agree with Steve completely, and I'll agree with Richard 99%. Because I, I actually don't... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, but I, I think that the save the cat moment, that feeding the cat moment, w was not a save the cat moment. I don't think it was. Because I think it was almost like a moment in which... Because he was very happy. You know, he had made a little bit of money and he was like, you know, on cloud nine. And there is a kind of sense when you give to someone in a worse state than you, it, like, like a little power thing. Like, like, oh, I can give something away because you know, I'm so cool. I, and in that case, it was a cat. In the case of, I forget the guy's name, but his buddy who came from the same region of town that he came from that was a much more successful yeah. boy. Chun Ho, um, I believe. It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, he, he did the same thing exactly with the Indian. He gave him some money for the bus. You know, like, oh, here, just take some money for the bus. I'm, I'm rich. It doesn't matter, you know, kind of thing. He still wanted to kind of live that lifestyle and feel that power. Uh, so, you know, so you can look at these things as sympathetic. You can look at these things as like kind acts. I didn't. And there's two reasons why I think that I related to these characters and I liked the, the good guys and I hated the bad guys and that kind of stuff. And the first thing comes down to casting. And that's something I don't think has been mentioned yet. Casting was fucking brilliant. Okay. The, the, the lead actor, he was kind of this classic, almost like a manga over actor. Where he'd be like, ah, you know, like everything would be like really big eyes and, you know, ah, oh, I can't believe this is happening, this kind of thing. You know, he'd overact, he'd move his arms, like everything was kind of overacting, at least at first. That, that kind of tapered away as the show continued. Uh, the girl was exactly the opposite, right? The, the girl was like very subdued, almost like American style acting. Um, but the, the, express, the expressive nature of that main character um, you liked him. He had big eyes. He had kind of he had kind of like an open open features. He just had a likable look. He was sort of like a likable scoundrel. Um, and basically, all of the characters that you like had faces that you would like. And all the guys that you don't like were nasty looking guys. I mean, they don't do that in Hollywood anymore because you know, big is beautiful and all that shit. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, that's kind of how they used to make films in the 80s. And the Koreans looked at that and said, okay, yeah, you're, you know, the, at least the people who were casting this film or maybe the writer-director um, decided that we're going to cast, like, these unlikable sort of nasty-looking guys as the villains and we're going to cast these likable, kind of more attractive people as the heroes. And the other reason that I think you really start to like these, the good guys, characters, is that despite the fact that they're scoundrels, you have a couple of, you have a couple of very good characters, um, in the Indian and the old man. Well, at least we think the old man's good at first, and they're kind of like they're kind of like the Oliver Twist of this show. I, I don't know if you guys read Oliver Twist, but Oliver Twist, of course, yeah. the book Oliver Twist, Oliver Twist has like no personality. I mean, you you almost know nothing about him. The only thing that you know about him is how others treat him, and you like characters that treat him well. And you hate characters that treat him poorly. That's what Oliver Twist is not about Oliver Twist. It's about everyone else in the book. <laughs> he is just the conduit by which you see those other characters, you know, um, or the window through which you see the other characters. And in this case, the, a character was good or bad if they treated the Indian good or well or poorly, or if they treated the old man well or poorly. And that's basically what the divide was. And that's why we would love some characters and we would hate some others. And that was fucking genius. I mean, it's really a well-written. Yeah, one of the one of the interesting aspects of this show is um, kind of like the the play on how these characters are set up because you have a situation where, after it's established what these Squid Games are and how dangerous they are, uh, the characters actually decide to leave the game and go back to their lives, and then they realize just how awful their lives are and decide to go back to the games uh, as a way to lift themselves out of their current situations so like they do the smart thing that the audience would say like yeah i'm not going to continue playing these games because like i'd get killed but then the the characters make the conscious decision okay i'm actually going to go and play this game and that sets things up in a way that we're not used to because like here in america we're just used to writers being so dumb it's like oh yeah like they'll they'll go and they won't make that conscious decision they'll just be thrust into that situation and one of the interesting kind of foils for our main character, Jihun, is, uh, you know, the, the other guy, um, Jun Ho, which 
you know, uh, he got uh, John Ho's mother to give him that leftover mackerel uh, to bring back to his mom, and he gave the cat the, that stuff. And what's interesting about um, the the John Ho character is that he starts off sympathetic and likable because he's like, you know, like I lost I lost all this stuff and I need to get it back, and that's my motivation for doing this stuff. Like I want to save my mom, I want to do all this stuff. And throughout the course of the series, the parts switch where John Ho becomes extremely unlikable. And uh, Jihan becomes very likable. It, it, it's kind of like an interesting uh, juxtaposition there. Um, but one of the big things that Jun Ho brings to the table and, and the Squid Games in general are these moral dilemmas that the characters are constantly kind of running up against. And I think that's one of the things that makes Jihan such a uh, likable character later on is because when he's faced with these moral dilemmas, he tends to do the right thing, right? Even though it's to his detriment sometimes. So, uh, one of the great things about crafting moral dilemmas is that it actually creates like natural tension and drama in a story. So I want to ask you guys, uh, what do you think is a good way to create moral dilemmas to further along the story? Uh, Chris, uh, why don't we start with you? I actually wrote a short story once called The Dilemma. And it was really just an exercise in trying to create a moral dilemma. Um, but I was drinking when you asked the question, so I don't remember the specific. <laughs> well, I, I, I just wanted I your opinion on how to craft moral dilemmas ah, that, that ah, further the yes. story and put the characters in interesting situations that can create tension <clears throat> and drama. Yeah, I mean, so uh, there, there's a lot of these. Um, I love, I love the, these, um, uh, what do you call, I forget what they're called, but this idea where, you know, you have a train and it's driving along a track and the track splits. And you're in control of which, uh, you know, which which fork, you know, which which track that the train's going to go on. Is the train going to kill this 17 people, or if you push the fat person onto the track to kill, which will kill him, but derail the train and save the 17 people? You know, should you do that? I love these kinds of questions, these kinds of moral dilemmas. And I, I you know, honestly, like if you're going to write something like Squid Game. It's it's a it's a fairly easy thing to start to think of these kinds of moral dilemma questions. Um, you know, you can like look them up. Uh, you know, other moral dilemmas that people have asked, and you can create. Um, I think I think the movie Saw does this right. I, I haven't seen Saw, but I think Saw kind of has these kinds of questions, like you know, if you do this or if you sacrifice this or something, you're gonna uh, uh, live. And actually, Saw has the same ending with the villain. I think. To some degree, so maybe this guy was inspired a lot by Saw. I don't know, but <laughs> uh, but but once you, because like I I've written a lot of scripts where I I have the character has to deal with a moral dilemma in some way or another, and once you start thinking about what a moral dilemma is, and you start to research them, and you start to think about them a lot, you can excuse me, you can come up with moral dilemmas actually pretty easily, um, and then if you are a really good writer, then you can inject them into the script in a way that actually um, seems natural. I had a kind of dystopian type story once in which two people uh, had to go on a kind of, uh, it's like a game show thing where they're both in a different series of rooms, but they're, the, but they're, they're sort of mirrored. They're like the same room, you know, the same room, but they're separated. And then they each have to, they're each asked basically the same question and they have to come up with the same answers. And as they go through the rooms, you know, there's different serious moral dilemmas. And when they get to the final room, they're told they have to kill a child. And they say, you know, if, and it's a husband and wife, we find out through the game, it's a husband and wife. And if the husband kills his child, his wife lives. And if the wife kills her child, then the husband lives. And um, she can't do it. She can't kill her, her child. So she knows her husband's died, right? And then the game ends, and, or the trial ends. And they, they say, uh, you know, you have passed. And they, they kind of send them on their way. And, and neither of them killed the, the child, and they both were fine. But what they're now allowed to do is procreate. So this is, like sent, this is like in the future, and you have to go through this trial in order to be given a license to have a kid because like, there's overpopulation or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I had to do it kind of like that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you, once you write, once you decide that I'm going to jump into this kind of story and I'm going to write this kind of thing, I think that the moral dilemmas are, 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 are pretty easy. 
I think more so it's integrating it into the kind of a story where it seems natural. I, I think that's a harder part. I think elements of stories are pretty easy. If you don't want to write an action scene, I think you can kind of figure that out. If you want to write love, love scenes and stuff, you can kind of figure that out. I think it's integrating it into the story seamlessly and naturally that is a little bit more tricky. Well, let me ask Richard, because a lot of the moral dilemmas that are introduced in the Squid Games extend from the games that are being played. And, you know, there's all this strategizing going on about, like, who you're going to team up with or, like, what's, you know, what the game is actually going to be. So uh, how do how did Squid Games create such great drama out of these moral dilemmas? And how can storytellers learn from that? Well, it's I, th I think what the, one of the strengths with Squid Game was that when it came down to some of the moral dilemmas, a lot of the, the decisions they're making is life or death. So that's easy. Those are super high stakes. So that's like when you could just go to the tug of war episode. You pull them over or they pull you over. I mean, this is not too hard. But when you get down to uh, later on with the, the marble game, which is my favorite episode, the whole thing, oh, yeah. where all of a sudden now all, it's like it's you or me. And now all of a sudden these people who paired up, which is a brilliant idea, the way they, 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 the, the game tricked them in to pairing up with someone they didn't want to have killed. Because they just they just did the thing with the um, the tug of war like oh I want strong people with me now they just say pick someone else and everyone thinks I want someone strong with me yeah. and it, it, that all uh, that decision goes poorly for everyone <laughs> uh, when it came down to the marbles so but when it comes to putting in the moral decision for the if you want to have something compelling for the readers one stakes okay I mean like we had the the the, the train track that's a classic one. And then, you know, in, in Squid Game, basically, it's always, almost always life and death. For these so, okay, that, that's pretty easy. But, and then when it comes down to, it, when you have this high stakes, and it's not immediately easy, because, you know, if it's you versus a complete stranger in the Marvel game, you, you want to win. You know, I don't even know who this guy is. I want to live. Versus how the show did, it's Gihan and the old man who he's been taking care of this whole time who he doesn't really want to see perish and you no know, i think what was great with that with that episode just the whole dynamic of all the pairs that we watched we saw gihan and the old man and how did gihan win he he, he had no luck he ends up having to rely on the yeah, old man's yeah, yeah he, he kind of cheats to win and he knows he cheats to win at the end even though the old man says, here's the last one you're a good kid Go can, can I interject that real quick? Because I just wanted to say how brilliant that scene is. And the reason I, I love that so much is because it's the one time in that show where I saw somebody do something wrong or bad, you know, because a lot of these things were very clear cut, good and bad. Very clearly a bad thing that I said I would do that too. Yeah. And I think, and I think almost of... everybody would. And it yeah. is, it's a terrible thing to think. But if you're honest with yourself, you go, yep, I would do it. Yeah, because the old man, he, he's got the brain cancer. He ain't going to win the other games. Yeah. So you're thinking, it's like, I'm kind of, I kind of deserve to, he does, Gion deserves to win. He's the only one that can actually go forward. What's the point of letting the old guy win? And you suffer with him because you yeah. know that's not something he yeah. wants. Yeah, but yeah. when he starts cheating, you're like, I can understand. I know yeah, what you're doing, guy. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough scene. It's so good. So yeah, yeah. yeah so, it's, um, so, Steve, one of the interesting aspects of a moral dilemma is the audience will instantly ask the question, what would I do when faced with this situation? And if the character does what they chose, they tend to identify with that character. If the character doesn't do what they chose, they tend to dislike that character. And so it, like, it's an interesting way to kind of play off of audience expectations. Um, what do you think is, is like a good way to you know, set up moral dilemmas to get the audience invested in it? Well, uh, I think uh, you just said it right there. First off, we're by the time a lot of these roll around, we are already emotionally invested in each and every one of these characters on some way or another. Even the crazy chick, she's you know, <laughs> we still we just don't want to see her die horribly. We just you know we feel bad for her, but she you know because she, she's, she's actually a redemption character. She does yeah, well. Yeah. She does, and uh, so. But I think a big part of it is uh, if we take what Richard said with the choices, what. And, and reverse it look at their initial choices in the tug of war they wanted to help their friends they want to make sure their friends were taken care of you know hey you know we're here i feel bad because i don't know what what's going on these guys are over here picking up all the men is that the right thing to do and unbeknownst to them they had a mole 
the the doctor who was feeding them information and letting them know what the game was. So they're taking care of their friends, which I think all of us would do. Mm-hmm. And we're told that was the wrong choice. And it's gruesome because it's so heart wrenching for us to see you were trying to help your friends. And you know what? You're probably going to die for it. And, you know, granted with the tug of war, it was, it worked really, really well, but I think that's part of it. It's like show the obvious good choice, the obvious, you know, friendly choice versus the survival choice, which is, Hey, I'm in it for myself. And, uh, the marble game was even more brutal because we were told, okay, find someone good. And by this time they're like, Hey, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. We've got to do some game. We're paired up. No one wanted to pair with the girl because they had no idea. The odd, odd thing is, is she would, that game would have been the easiest for her by far. She would have killed anybody no no questions asked it's like i'm gonna kick your ass because that's who she was she was all about survival meanwhile you take gihan who feels terrible for this old guy and they're like what's gonna happen to him if he doesn't get picked oh god and it turns out oh yeah congratulations you've got to kill him i mean that's that's brilliant because it, we don't we're not expecting it and even though we should based on the tug of war it's um so in a nutshell i think if you you create a moral the the initial moral stake what it appears to be or what would be the right moral choice when all of the you know you have no information and then punish the characters for it by forcing them to do something um that's based in survival their own personal survival uh in in selfishness essentially i think that right there is really what made these moral moral choices so um so gut-wrenching and powerful for them yeah, I think, I, uh, I, I think that as a storyteller, one of the keys to making a good moral dilemma is that, you know, you have a clear right and wrong, correct? Right. That, that, I mean, that's the, the the moral aspect of it. But the, the dilemma aspect of it is as a writer, you have to craft things so that if you do the right thing, you're going to be punished for doing it. But if you do the wrong thing, you're going to be rewarded. Right. And that's the dilemma thing. It's like, do I am I the shitty person who you know, goes on to the next game, or am I the good person that suffers for being good? And and when you craft your moral dilemma like that, it, it becomes very interesting because, you know, uh, the audience and the characters are like, well, which one would I do? And, you know, in, in Squid Games, you had like the real estate or the, uh, the stockbroker guy constantly doing the wrong thing um, yeah. because he wanted to get rewarded. And then you had the main character, uh, 456, doing the right thing and constantly having to deal with its consequences. And so I always think that that's a good way to craft moral dilemmas and kind of going hand in hand with with this. Mm -hmm. um, I I felt like the show was kind of like a very extreme version of the show survivor, you know, and, uh, and (laughs) I, I, I think that like the dynamics of social alliances and betrayal uh, are always very fascinating to me because they're just so inherent with with uh, drama and tension. So, uh, you know, one of the fascinating aspects of Squid Games is how they use social alliances and betrayal to create not only drama, but shocking twists and turns within the narrative. And so what I want to know is how can storytellers set up realistic alliances that audiences invest themselves in and then break those alliances in a believable and surprising way? Uh, Richard, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think one of the brilliant things about the writing here is that you know these characters they start setting up social alliances. You saw the the, the thugs all kind of got together, and then some of the more like the like minded characters got together, and then the game punished people for doing that. And I, like uh, you had the husband and wife team in the the marble episode, and we didn't even see them. We we knew they were husband and wife. We knew they paired yeah, up. Yeah, you just see the husband. And, yeah, we just right. see the husband at the end, and the, they just skipped showing all of that drama. I think that was pretty good because husband and wife trying to choose between who lives that's low hanging fruit. You know. No, you get, no, it was so effective just to see yeah. him yeah. afterwards. But, so effective. But you saw the the North Korean girl and the the girl that she yeah. you know clicked with, and who were like, hey, we can be friends, and like, oh, oh, one of us is gonna die in eight minutes. Oh, okay. And and, and that friend kept kept picturing stuff that they would do together yeah. after they got out of it. And, it was, and she was like, oh, wait, one of us is going to die. Yeah, and every so time the show just, just punching the, re- the audience in the gut, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, sure. That was brilliant. Sure. But uh, so so when it comes to us, you know, uh, every human beings are very, you know, we're, we're tribal, clannish sort of animals. So mm-hmm. we all know how to, to define our tribe 
and kind of stay where they're dry. So, you know, trying to convince people how to do that, it's pretty easy. Everyone knows how to do it. But when the good news, but when the story needs to do is try to interject the drama into it. Okay, you found a group. Uh oh, wrong group. What do you do now? And when it comes to betrayal, if someone's going to betray someone, when do you know we expect to see um, some karma come from that? Mm-hmm. And the the gangster guy, he definitely got it. He definitely. <laughs> and and I, you, there's one thing that you saw when uh, the crazy lady, the the uh, the fraudster lady, no one would, no one wanted to part to partner with her for the Marvel game. And what happened? She got a pass. Yeah. And it's like, oh. And the, and, uh, the audience is like, you know, because they... Well, the, ex- the expectation was she was going to die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you were, like, everyone is, oh, she's going to get a bullet? We don't care. Show me. But no, no. She got the pass. And it's like, oh. <laughs> we good job. Care. Good, good job, Joe. Be- I like that. That was, that was, you know, you can antagonize the audience you know, along the way, but eventually you have to pay off what the audience's expectation is. And when, you know, we had that the alliance that the crazy lady had with the thug and then the betrayals along the way. And then finally the, uh, the karma comes back when she's, when he's sitting there going, like, I'm not moving forward. Somebody else come. And she's like, here we go, buddy. And then, you know, gravity, uh, solved that issue. <laughs> so it's, um, but when it comes to, you know, social alliances and betrayals, if you show, if there's going to be a betrayal, you need to have some sort of consequence to that. And as far as social alliances, um, you know, it's, it's a source of drama. And we've all been to high school, so we understand that. <laughs> and but you know, uh, you as writers out there, you need to show, like, oh, look at this great decision we made. And then all of a sudden, the rules change, and that decision isn't too good anymore. And then when it comes time to have another alliance, everyone's like, Ugh. so like the very end where there's the three of them, and they all have a knife, and so kind of like, what do we do? And then, and then you you, you kind of have the, what, the one alliance between uh, Kang and Jihan, and he kind of balled that one up. But you, you know they they you saw how they had an alliance and didn't end up not working out. Yeah, Steve. One of the things that I think makes a good betrayal is number one, you either don't see it coming, or number two, you see it coming and you don't want it to happen. Yeah. Um, so if, if we look at the different betrayals that happened uh, throughout the course of this show, what do you think were the most powerful ones, and why do you think they work so well? Well, uh, as a kind of a exception to your point, I think the the best betrayal obviously was a crazy chick taking gangster through the, through the class. Uh, mm-hmm. That was a betrayal, and even though it was, it still it was it was pre. It, we knew it was coming. Something was going to happen between the two. Either he was going to kill her, or she was going to kill was him. Was that a betrayal? I think she was betrayed by him, and then she she got was revenge. yeah, but she was, but she that was I guess that's more karma. I guess you're right about that. Well, but, she she even said. At the beginning, she was like, "I'll take you down if you betray yeah, me." I know, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a, that that was a well, that was a very powerful one. And then you yeah. had um, the the slow fall of uh, the this you know Mister Intelligent, uh, the, uh, the stockbroker. Stockbroker, yeah, yeah. he he was uh, Mister Everything. He was set up to be this larger than life hero. Everyone li- wanted him on the team because he was smart. He figured sh- stuff out, but his betrayal. To the group that was really powerful right there to me because he had been played you saw it slowly you talking about red light green light or are you talking about something else no no i'm talking about the the uh stockbroker at the very end i mean he started talking during that and helped out uh, uh, as well as uh the the indian guy that you know, gra- you know grabbing him that was oh. amazing but with the uh, red light green light he um that or not red light green light sorry not red light green light i'm talking about um the, well, the, it, the one where we, they have to lick the, the yeah with, with the stockbroker. So the sugar cookie episode or right. game, he kind of betrayed uh, Jihan right uh, by not warning him about. Yeah, to me that the was the yeah. moment he became the villain in the show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and, well, and then uh, in addition to that, his betrayal of his Indian partner with the marble game that was probably the most. Uh, he did all dirty. Was, yeah, that, yeah, that that was, was, yeah. Yeah, that made him was, worse than the than the than the than the mobster, I think. Yeah, it did. I mean, he because he was a secret villain, and that was a, a big part of it. The he, the audience saw it before the the characters saw it, and that's a very powerful technique because they don't realize how bad this guy actually is until it's too late. Uh, he, it was a it was a slow descent, and if it had happened one time, we'd have probably forgotten about it. But once it happened, it had to continue to happen. And by the end, him, uh, you know, him gutting uh, the North Korean girl, you know, or slitting her throat, that was like, okay, that's it. I mean, 
he's he's terrible yeah, the, and the the stockbroker character like his whole motivation was he was always in it to win it right and so you always knew where, where he was coming from now chris one of the fascinating aspects of a good betrayal is when you have two characters that you actually like and you actually want to see both of them succeed and they're forced to kind of go against each other and one of them is going to come out the winner and you're not sure who to root for um can you think of of good ways in which to set up a uh, situation like that for storytellers like what we saw in this show yeah i mean i i would not i would not define that as a betrayal i you know again i think that kind of goes back to the moral dilemma question uh, more and i you know you actually inspired me to think of something on how to write a good moral dilemma which is I do think, instead of saying, you know, is it good or is it evil, I think a good moral dilemma asks the question, you know, should you be altruistic or selfish? And I think if the answer is you should be altruistic, the altruistic thing has to be much heavier than the selfish thing, right? Because the selfish thing is always the go-to. If you could, like, kind of help other people out, but, like, really help you out, you're going to pick yourself, of course. But if you could really help other people out a lot and like kind of, you know, on the other hand, baby, barely help yourself out, that becomes a much better dynamic because then you're like, you're like, okay, the right thing to do is obviously to help the many, many people. And the wrong thing to do is like slightly help yourself. And then, it, it, you know, that, that creates a, a choice in which, okay, that if the person chooses themselves, then they are bad. And if they help the many people, they're good. But then if you make it kind of a little bit more equal, right? Like you could really help yourself out or you could kind of help a lot of people out, you think then that becomes a much better dynamic because then it's, then it's a little like, I don't know what I'd do in that circumstance. You know, like the marbles, you, you, you know the right thing to do is to play fair, but you know you wouldn't do it, you know? Uh, and look, I, but the, with the question of betrayal, I hate writing betrayal in stories generally. I, I think that it's rarely something you can kind of do in a way that is satisfying to an audience because it's always such a fucking downer. <laughs> you know, it's always something that's like, you know, it's, it, shocking. You have, yeah. it's, it's a shocking thing, but it's also like a depressing thing and, a, and an unpleasant thing. And it's like, there's a new show called uh, Ted Lasso. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's a couple seasons in. And, um, I don't know if this is a spoiler for people or not, but in the second season, in the first season, there's a guy, he's like the towel boy. And he ends up saying something. He ends up um, explaining a play to the coach and the, and the coach tries it out and it's really a good play. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to hire you as an assistant coach. And this kid's like, that's awesome. And the kid has like very low self-esteem and he kind of hates himself and stuff. And so you really like this for the kid. And it's like a redemption character in the way, not a bad character that becomes good, but a weak character that becomes like a little bit stronger. And you really like that for him, you know? And then in the second season, for whatever reason, the writers decided, let's make this guy the main villain of the show. <laughs> Which, and it's, it's a, it was a horrible decision because this character that you've grown to really love and care about and want him to succeed, now because this totally arrogant piece of shit and starts to like betray people all over the place and then by the end of the season two if you haven't seen it i apologize spoiler alert he becomes the primary villain of the show there's like a darth vader moment you know where he becomes like the ultimate <laughs> villain for the show and it's just like why would you do that why would you take a, a, a character that you you've brought us up moment by moment to really love and made him bad and it's like it just it just feels gross and icky and nasty so Creating a betrayal character is very, very difficult. And I, I think that, that what they did with the um, accountant or whatever, his stockbroker, was so really uh, 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 well done because I, I think this is the only way to do it. What Steve was saying, what a really good way to do it is to let the audience know that this guy is kind of a bad guy before everybody else does. So you're like, guys, you got to be careful of that guy. Guys, you got to be careful of that guy. Exactly. I think that's the really the only really good way of of creating a betrayal character for the heroes. If you create a character that the audience really loves, and then you sort of up oh, twist, he's a bad guy. Um, I, I I think it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. I I think that they will kind of hate your story. 
I think the opposite is actually true as well. Uh, if you if you have a redemption character that seems bad and turns out to be good, or or seems weak and then turns out to be strong, audiences fucking love that, you know. So put that in every story. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, so real quick, one of the things I just want to point on is that in order for a, a betrayal to be kind of shocking or like really impactful with the audience, you have to attach some type of stake to it. You know, like a betrayal of like a wife sleeping with like another man, you know, um, the, the stakes for that is just like, okay, the marriage breaks up. But if you're really invested in that couple as a family, that could be a high stake thing. Uh, in the case of Squid Games, the betrayals are life and death, kind of like how Richard pointed out before. So when you have some type of stakes attached to a betrayal, it can make it really impactful. And when it comes to the alliance aspect, the big thing about alliances is trust. Uh, a good alliance is with people that you trust, know that they have your back, that your interests are aligned. But oftentimes, especially in shows like Survivor or Squid Games or just like in fiction in general, um, the best, most dramatic alliances are where people are forced to team up with people they don't trust. And they have to, and just through circumstances, they have to trust these people, even though they don't, in order to just like move forward. And so that can create a lot of like really interesting drama and, and conflict uh, and tension in a story if, if you uh, have these alliances that you aren't sure on, are on the up and up. So storytellers, just keep that in mind. Now I want to move on to this idea of cultural deviations. And so um, Squid Games is a South Korean production, of course. It's not an American production. Um, and I want to know, could a show like this have actually been made in America? And do you think cultural differences such as Korean culture versus American culture play a role in how the show turned out to be so good? Because I doubt if an American company was making this, it would have turned out as, as good as it did. And what are some differences between South Korean and American storytelling? So I want to start with Richard on this because he actually has been to Korea and knows the culture there. So Richard, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, South Koreans are different. And one thing uh, about the Koreans is that when it comes to watching drama, they really up the drama. Like, I, and I hate to get into stereotypes, but if you are a fan of Mexican telenovelas, if you watch South Korean dramas, you're going to be like, that's too much. Because they can, they can go a little overboard. Now, I don't know what it is with South Korean dramas, but every single episode, someone gets hit by a car. <laughs> I don't like. It's like when you used to be able to watch WWE, and you could guarantee someone's getting that steel chair. And you can just watch a South Korean show like, here comes the car. Here it is. Yeah, I don't know what we're doing with that, but it, it always happened. Uh, but, but as for, you know, I watched, I watched a, a number of, of South Korean movies, and, and some of the tropes sort of came out. Like Ali, he's working in a, in a factory, and he's just not getting paid by a guy who's got money for him. I've seen that trope so many times. It's like, okay, it's relatable. I guess it's, it's, it happens a lot more often in South Korea than here in America. But as for could you have Squid Games, the U.S. version? I think so. I live in Las Vegas. There are, you know, if, if you are ever in a casino kind of late at night before payday, like it's 1130 p.m. and at midnight is payday, you will see lots and lots of people just sort of congregating around the ATM. And what they're doing is they're waiting for the bank to send their paycheck and they promptly withdraw it and then go lose it on the tables. So now Asians, for whatever reason, have more of a reputation for being hardcore gamblers. Macau has like 40 times the gambling revenue of Las Vegas. So, wow. I mean, they're just that's just math. So, but in America, if we say, oh, we're going to get a bunch of, you know, get all these degenerate gamblers and, you know, get them into this game. I think it would work. And but as for, you know, some of the other things. Uh, Are you, you know, recommending that we actually try this? No, 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 I, no it's. Let's go to Except Vegas, I, guys. What I'm, what I'm saying is, is that casting would be easy. So, well, so. you know, I, I wasn't asking so much about like the logistics of an American um, version. I'm mm -hmm. more about the people behind it. Like, like, could an American production company actually make a show as good as this in the same way that the Koreans did? I don't know if they could do it without all the virtue signaling. Because it seems, yeah, like that was my point signal. earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, even with gosh darn lord of the rings that amazon's doing they're saying don't worry the hobbits are gonna be multicultural and everyone who's waiting for this is like that's not what we want and yeah yeah we're gonna I, take, I, a, we're I gonna take be... a european setting and yeah. just fill it full of people from yeah America. it's um i i don't know if they could pull off something like this and the irony is is that you know everyone jokes about what the netflix version is going to be like and like we look at how cowboy bebop is starting to, starting to look like the live action version 
It's like every, all the all the memes about the Netflix version coming true. But Squid Game starts on Netflix, so it's like, where do they go from here? But, um, but culture. Yeah, why wise, were there no white people in that? I don't understand. They're racist well, over uh, there in South Korea. <laughs> it's um. Yeah, there, well, there, there was elite. There, there were white people towards the end. They just had masks. That's yeah, true. They had masks on. Yeah. The one the dude. Terrible actors. The terrible. Oh actors. yeah, they. Yeah, that that's where like the one show really became Asian when they had like the the really awful American actors who end up working in in Asia somehow because because they couldn't get work in L.A. I was just I was just watching that thinking, man, like I wish I would have somehow been involved with this, and I could say, guys, stop. We cannot <laughs> hire these people. They are fucking horrible. <laughs> like we have to go to L.A. get some real actors. I can pick them. We'll bring them over. Oh, they, it was it was terrible. Yeah, but if That's if all of a sudden they said, "Oh, hey, HBO is going to have the, the 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 HBO version of Squid Game," I'd be like, "We'll see." So I wouldn't be excited about it. Well, they gender swapped the main character first of all, and make her a strong black woman mm-hmm. and uh, lesbian. You know, yeah, lesbian too. Uh, Steve, uh, do you think that a Squid Games could be made here in America? And what do you think uh, advantages it had being made in South Korea versus like something like the states? Oh, uh, well, could it be made? Sure. Would it be worth a damn? <laughs> oh, that's a whole other bag, ball of wax, isn't it? I, I think a big part of the, the, the issue is that you know, even if we get off the virtue signaling, which is so popular these days, they American studios tend to dumb it, take things like this and dumb it down or take like a literal flavor out of it. A, a good example of this would be the movie Old Boy. I don't know if you guys saw the original Korean version. Oh, it was a phenomenal movie. I I've really... only seen the Korean, but I did not see the Spike Lee oh, <laughs> version. Yeah, I'd be glad it's uh, here. It's just it's just a recipe for disappointment watching it. And you know, Spike Lee's got made some great films, and they, but it just it yeah <laughs> yeah some. But they uh, the problem is, is it just the again the flavor of it just gone. It, it's like everything that made it special about being what it was was lost and maybe it's lost in translation um and you know matt i I did mention to you that the i've been reading about the director of squid game upset about the translation of this i mean that's a big part of it and i i think um if you ignore a lot of these pieces you're going to be in trouble and i that's spike lee did he he ignored or just wasn't culturally aware can, enough. Can, can you go into detail about the why he was upset about the English translation of the Netflix uh, version? Well, it, from what I understand, it's it was a lot of what was left out. It was a very simple translation. Some of the stuff that was said really wasn't what was said. The nuance was. Was this the voiceover or the? Yeah, the, the both actually. The from what okay. I understand, because I didn't. It, I, I watched the Korean version with the text. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, from, uh, I watched, I watched the dub version. So what, from what I understand it, there was elements, the nuance of the language. And I mean, Richard could par- probably speak into this a little more, although I, you know, I don't know. I, it's, uh, there, there's going to be language differences that didn't make it. So I think he was, he was upset about that and wants to go back and change all this and redub it or, re uh subtitle it or you know because there's a, another point with the closed caption and the subtitled versions i mean oddly enough the translation is completely different once again so it's almost like seeing three different versions of the story and that's going to be confusing for an audience and uh and i, I think but in that tr- if there's three different versions in Eng- at english three different english translations to one story, yeah, you're going to lose something. You're going to absolutely lose something, and I think that's a big point. And um, speaking uh, on a different note, culturally, uh, there were certain things that were very prominent that I don't think would translate. Uh, notice the card and the symbols, the face symbols, the, the triangle, the square, the circle. We all know what those are. It's games. That is a damn PlayStation right there. The only one that wasn't was an X. But we're also talking about the largest gaming culture in the world, uh, South Korea, uh, video games. It's per capita. They have more gamers. It is a a thing there. I mean, there are 
their version of an arcade is a computer. And there are people who are amazing at these things. These uh, e-games players that you know, they're, they're surrounded. They have groupies. It, it's a, it's a phenomenon. And uh, you don't see that you maybe see it a little bit in the other Asian countries. You don't see that here. I mean, people, ga- even though gaming is popular. So that impact in that country, even though it still had the, the vast impact here, would you keep it? Would it have the same impact? I don't know. But I think uh, it's getting that translation down. And you would have to really have someone who is very smart because I guarantee you Spike Lee doesn't speak Korean and he didn't bother because that's what happened with old boy. And I would be very hesitant to watch an Americanized version of, of you know, I, I just I, I think I'd be very hesitant unless you know i got matt to watch it first and then i'll come and watch it myself so yeah uh, chris uh so a lot of kind of very innovative cinema has been coming out of south korea lately like you had train to busan arguably the yeah. best zombie movie ever made you have uh, parasite uh academy award-winning uh, drama which was really off the wall i don't know if anyone's out there's ever seen it but it's very yeah. good movie. Now you have something like Squid Games coming out and making waves, and American audiences just seem to be resonating with this style of storytelling, where it, it's just like it's pure entertainment. Like the, even though it might have some thematic stuff going on to it, it's like here's the story. It's in your face. We're not holding back. Um, why do you think uh, you know? Obviously, American audiences love this stuff. Why do you think American entertainment can't give it to us? Oh, well, you know, it was like what I said before. I mean, they, they care too much about virtue signaling. They care too much about, you know, sending the radical left political message, um, feminism, um, you know, this idea that, you know, everybody has to be a black lesbian and everything now. And, and you know, the, the Koreans are, are doing something very, very smart, at least, at least with Squid Game and... Um, Parasite. I saw Parasite. I didn't see the zombie movie. Uh, I'll have to check that out. That sounds great. It's really good. It's getting an American remake, by the way. Oh, so. sexy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's that sounds uh, fantastic. So uh, <laughs> no, uh, pa- Parasite, Parasite and Squid Game are the only two Korean films I've watched in a long time, uh, or I think maybe ever. Um, but uh, but uh, Old Boy is a, a great uh, film as well. Very good reference. And then, um, what was that film they made before Hunger Games in Japan? Oh, a Battle Royale. Battle Royale. The 90s. Yeah, phenomenal movie. And all of these films have the same, like, one thing in common. Well, I guess two things in common. They sort of take a Twilight Zone type approach to the structure. Like, you know, it's like a big setup and a reveal. Right, a big twist at the end. Um of the game is there they, they have somebody uh so, somebody in um <clears throat> playing the game like spying on the contestants or something and i said you know what i think it's the old man and i think the old man made the whole thing i think he's the one that did it so i had this kind of cause, and the reason i said that is because i was like that's how i would write it because that, that's my th- i don't you guys don't know me but that's my that's my thing i like the twist ending i like the twilight zone thing so I actually had spotted that really in the first episode, but I didn't think he was gonna. I didn't think the writer would do it because I was like, "Well, that's too smart. People, people don't write films that good anymore." You know, and then not, they did not it. Not America, like, anyway. Not America, right? Right. Well, that's the thing. You, you get so accustomed to American films, you're like, nobody's this good. And then they did it, and I was like, "This guy is a genius." And so that that's one thing that all those films have in common is a twist ending. Not, not uh, Battle Royale so much. That's more of like incredibly cool, high concept thing that kind of a lot of other films kind of copied and did some similar stuff with. But, you know, this whole concept of the twist ending, but like this real kind of like mental game that you're playing, making these films. And then you pair that with another similarity. Hello, hello boy. <laughs> uh, you pair that with another uh, similarity between them all, which is that they take a sort of 80s sensibility to yeah. filmmaking. And in the 80s, this is going to sound kind of crazy because the 80s was very stylized and very, everything was like big and kind of like, uh, you know, powerful and, and like bigger than life. But one thing that the 80s did really well is it would 
try to portray characters in a way that was relatable and naturalistic. In the 80s, you would have the, you know, okay, this is the late 70s, but Luke Skywalker was a farm boy, you know, um, I think they were farming water. I don't know. But Moisture anyway, farmer. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the, the desert. But, um, you know, he's growing up with his uncle, and he's saying stuff like, uh, what was his name? Uncle, what was Uncle it? Owen. Uncle Owen. He's like, come on, Uncle Owen. You know, like, <laughs> And we were all kind of doing that as kids. You were all like, come on, Dad. You know, we were all kind of uh, whining to our parents. And that, that kind of whininess or that sort of dreaming of being something greater than you are, a, a Jedi Knight or something, that was all something we could relate to. And they don't write that kind of stuff anymore in Hollywood. And the reason they don't do it, I think, is because they want to push this agenda. So instead of, you know, like uh, Captain Marvel, right? She basically can do no wrong, and she's perfect. And, and Ray is a great example. We've talked about this before, where Ray is sort of like a copy of, of Luke Skywalker, but without any of the struggle, without any of the, you, the you know, flaws. without any of the journey, without any of the flaws. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's just like this, like, she comes out of being, you know, this homeless youth speaking perfect English and being, you know, the greatest wizard in Jedi history and wielding the... You know, it was just ridiculous. I mean, the whole thing was like, uh, it wasn't relatable to anyone. Well, there was she no is all the Jedi, so. <laughs> Did they say that at some point? Oh, oh my Chris, God. Chris, don't ever watch. You said it out loud, too. Yeah, don't ever watch The Rise of Skywalker. I have watched it, I don't, yourself. you know, it's one of those Con things. Continue to block it out. Like, block yeah, it <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, the point is just that uh, they, you know, they, these Korean filmmakers are making films correctly what i would say correctly at least with um at least with the two films that we've mentioned here and, and then also old boys the same you know they're writing these characters in ways that are naturalistic i and i mentioned that earlier in the show but i do i do think that each one of these characters is somebody that i've met before in some kind of a way and yet they're south korean and i'm from america and i i, I don't i've met a few south koreans but i i don't have a lot of like you know, the people that I, I recognize in that show are white Oregonians. They're not South Koreans that I've met. I mean, this, the, the way that they've written these characters transcends culture. And that's one thing. I, I lived in, in the UK for a while, and that's one thing I really noticed is that the UK has all the same types of people that we have here in America. They just express themselves differently. You know, they have jocks. They have nerds. Uh, you know, they have cool guys. They have funny guys, whatever. You know, in any because I was in college there, and, and in you know any group of people, you're going to find similar makeup of mm -hmm. people. They're just going to express that differently in the kind of culture that they're from. Yeah, and I think and, the same uh, is true of Korea. Yeah, speaking of that, we have a ten dollar super chat from Nick Backyard Tardis. Korean and Japanese studios can do stuff that liberals would be outraged at a Western studio doing, but praise the Eastern studio stating yes. it's part of their culture. Uh, I was going to actually point. say that. that. That is such a good point. Yeah, I was going to mention that, that they can kind of get away with this 80s style of naturalistically portraying characters and not interjecting all of this social... Uh, actually, there's a big hubbub on Twitter right now about how um, Squid Game is a... Uh, is a critique of capitalism. Yeah, well, we're going to get to that. In a bit. Okay, so Sorry, I, yeah. I want you, to, I want you to save, uh, save it for that. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. One, of, you know, uh, it, it's very interesting because I think modern culture in Hollywood, it's all about what political messaging do we want to communicate and what entertainment can fit into that messaging. Whereas in South Korea, it's more like, okay, what story do we want to tell and what's the best way to tell it? And if we have some messaging, maybe we'll pepper it in. Now, Richard, I know that. You had something that you wanted to say about the the cultural aspect of this before right. we moved on. So uh, go ahead and hit us with it. I don't, I don't want to get. I'll get a little bit in the weeds on history, but South Koreans are really intense about being South about being Korean, and it, you know, because prior to World War II, they would have been occupied by the Japanese. The Japanese treated them like slaves. They weren't allowed to speak Korean outside of the home, and so when finally when they got liberated, they're like, "We're going to be Korean," and then then they get put in this war between the communists. Uh, had a fight had a fight there, but then South Korea just becomes its own little thing there in, in the in the East Pacific, and they had their culture and they fell back on what they knew on, on, as their culture. Like prior to World War II, all the writing in Korea was in Japanese or Chinese. They they had to go and find their old their old alphabet and then bring that back and use it as their own alphabet. So when you see Korean now, they they haven't been using it that long, just you know a couple decades. So. 
you know, and they're very interested about telling Korean stories the Korean way. And when if somebody came along and said, hey, 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 Korea, you need to change how you write your story to make Americans happy. Koreans, by and large, would look at you and say, please piss off. And, you know, and the Japanese have been doing this a lot this way. People have been criticizing anime and then criticizing manga. And the Japanese are just like, yeah, we're, we're going to do keep doing what we want. Thanks. So it, what's good is that, you know, South Korea, their, you know, their culture is such that they like being Korean and they're going to do it their way. And I, you know, I almost got beat up by a couple uh, Republic of Korean uh, army officers because there was a discussion about this island, which was just nothing but rock and seagulls out in the middle of nowhere. And the, the Japanese had said it was theirs and the North Koreans, or excuse me, the South Koreans had said it was there. And I accidentally referred to the Korean, the island by the Japanese name. It was like something, something Shima. Shima is the name for island. And oh my God, I, I, like, they're like, it's Dokto. It's Dokto Island. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. It's Dokto Island. Okay. They're, you know, they're, you know, it's absolutely no reason to have all this drama and tension over an island with nothing but, you know, but rocks and seagull poop. But the South Koreans were all about it because they freaking hate the Japanese. So, <laughs> and, but the good news is, is that, you know, there's, there are these little cultural bastions out there who, you know, when they're told, you need to sanitize so that we don't upset all the transgender, albino, Eskimo, Palestinian refugees living in Germany. So, you know, they won't do that for the Palestinian, albino, Eskimo, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's good. The South Koreans have the courage to say no to what Hollywood wants. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, it's like we have to tell the same exact same sanitized story over and over again. And I think there's a lot of times, and Steve, you probably know this better than I do, but there's sometimes when, you know, I've been sitting in a movie theater, and I look at my watch and I'm like, okay, here comes the A from beyond exactly on time when yeah. the hero's journey says it is. And I was like, I was sitting there watching Moana and, and like for the first time, and I leaned over to my son and said, yeah, uh, Maui's about to come back in three, two, boom, there's Maui. My son's like, how'd you know? I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, you, know, you, you know, what's funny, Steve uh, and Chris, you probably know about this too. So in Los Angeles, there's a legit Koreatown, right? And, uh, you know, me and Steve and some other friends, like we used to go down there, they got great steakhouses and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, they have these like K-clubs, they're called K-clubs, and it's just like clubs. Uh, but they're, they cater towards uh, Koreans only. So like, if you're not Korean, it's very hard to get in there. And I had an Asian friend of mine who kind of introduced me to Koreatown and all these different like clubs and restaurants and stuff down there. And he'd always tell me that uh, Koreans were some of the most racist people against other Asians that he'd ever met. So like, if you were Japanese, they hated you. If you were Chinese, they hated you. And I'm kind of wondering, like, if that national identity of, like, just being so, like, pro-Korean that they don't care what anyone else thinks frees them up to tell the type of stories where they don't have to worry about who they offend or who, who to cater to outside of their own kind of culture. Um, whereas with America, we're so concerned about being multicultural that we don't want to offend anybody. Um, just real quick, do you guys think that that might be something? I, I think that the I think that the Korean filmmakers probably have some sense at least the ones that are trying to do something for an international audience i think they would have some sense that like okay yeah you know americans hate racism we should probably shouldn't put some racism to, you know shouldn't put racism i will murder you cat <laughs> um well, I, I, mean, put... I mean like do you honestly think that the maker of squid games was thinking about what american audiences were going yeah, to think about think the so. show i do i, I don't think, think so. so because he was doing it for netflix no he wasn't it was a Korean production that Netflix got the rights to. Oh, is um, that true? Yeah, no, Netflix didn't. Pay I for thought the Netflix show. came to him and and no, and they 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 made a deal together. Well, then probably not. If it's for an international audience, it would be silly for for any filmmaker to not consider, you know, what's going to like. Yeah, see, see, what, what's America interesting about what's interesting about Korean stuff like the movies and the TV shows is they make them for Koreans. And then a service like Netflix picks them up and exposes them to Americans. And Americans are like, this is great. I want more of this. It, the, the same thing happened with that show Kingdom, which was about the, the feudal uh, South Koreans versus the zombies. Excellent show, by the way. Um, you, you know, that was something that was on South Korean TV. Netflix bought the rights to it, put it on their service. It blew up. 
So, you, you know, Netflix didn't commission this. They say it's a Netflix original because they bought the rights to it. They did yeah. not have anything to do with it. But I, I mean, I just read a lot of articles that referenced it in such a way that it seemed like that. But I didn't yeah. I didn't actually look into it specifically. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Um, yeah. What, one thing I wanted to add here, Matt, is uh, if you look at Korea's history and why this belligerence towards these other countries. I mean, if you go back and look at their history, I mean, Richard could probably tell you a little more than I could, but they've been embattled. They've, uh, you know, cut other countries have used them as a, a stomping ground to go go after someone else. They had the, all these wars, all these battles. And then, you know, of course, getting split up into two countries. They're, uh, they're tough. They're very yeah. tough people, and they're not going to be told what to do. And... But that also tied into their film industry. For a while in the 70s, they were in the, in a bad spot. There was a big moral, you know, dominance. It's like, okay, imagine if our religious right, hardcore was saying, okay, this is what you can put in movies. It's like the Legion of Decency. They went through their own period in the 70s like that. And when after that all happened and they backed off, that's when the true Korean storytelling started happening. It was over a period of time through the 80s, 90s, and they underwent their own basically renaissance with it. It was uh, they they it's like if you could add any type of um, you know movement like a neo realism movement, a new French New Wave movement. They actually had that stuff on their own. Uh, there's a movie that I saw in. Um, a friend of mine, a Korean friend, uh, showed me uh, years ago, and I was half asleep, so I barely remembered it, but it's called Volcano High. It came out in the early 2000s. It's a Korean movie that was very... Oh, yeah, Volcano very... High. We all know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it had its campy moments and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but it was also very experimental. It, uh, it grasped hold of uh, a lot of what Kurosawa did in his movies, Uh the the kind of, if you saw any of you saw dreams how it was supposed to represent this dream mm -hmm. and it it grabbed hold of that and had the dreams you know kind of dream structure involved yeah. in it made and, it an incredible movie yeah and speaking of dreams let's move on to our next topic which is the use of ab abstraction and this is something i feel like squid games did incredibly well so one of the things that they did is they used like masks and costumes to not only hide the identity of the antagonist, but also give them a unique look that elevates them above traditional antagonists and stories. So you have like people like the front man, you have the host, you have the workers, you have the American or the VIPs, I guess you could say, uh, with like the masks. And this creates a mis an element of mystery and unknown in the show. Uh, so what I want to ask you guys is how can abstraction be utilized in storytelling to not only create mystery, but also enhance threats and menace? So, Steve, you know, you had a good point about game symbols and stuff like that before. Uh, why don't we start with you? How well did this show use the concept of abstraction to further along its uh, its plot? You're muted, Steve. You got to unmute your. <laughs> there we go. All right. I thought I thought I did. Sorry about that. I thought I did okay. a phenomenal job. It was uh, the fact that. Oftentimes, if we have a, a character that's their face is covered, a bad guy, after a while, it could, it, it's just kind of, it could end up being very cheap in a lot of movies. They made these guys truly menacing and kept them menacing throughout the entire story. I mean, the, the, the symbols notwithstanding what they, the other reference was, it was, they, you know, represented death. I mean, you see these guys in these masks and, uh, you know, you kind of saw the social hierarchy, but. It was just just enough. Um, another point I wanted to bring up was, aside from the mask, was the telephone uh, that the the front man answered the the green telephone. It's simple little detail, but it was very powerful because at one point it's like it's almost nostalgia. He's answering an old school telephone hello, but if you go down li below that, we all have one of these. Everyone. And in the movie, they had it, or the show, they had them too. These are very personal. A phone is a not, like that is completely anonymous. So being able to pull back, pull this abstract idea of the worst guy in there using something to hide himself. Everything was hidden in that subplot with the, the two brothers, uh, the one, the, the police officer who snuck in. Uh, great subplot that, you know, I, I just, Phenom phenomenal part of the story that uh, ended with such a 
you know, in such a sad way for him. He, um, you know, had getting killed by his own brother, who he found or out had won. Did he? No, no, he wasn't killed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's gonna come. There back. was two characters that you didn't see die. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he he could. Hey, you know what? They they're set up for a sequel if they want it, but that story it's like that abstraction it's like what's underneath there and by re that's part of why it was effective because you remove the mask and find out oh shit that's his brother and i kind of saw it coming uh you know at the last, like five minutes out from when it happened but it it was it, nonetheless it was still very powerful so it's you have the symbol but it's what's underneath the symbol you know they unmask a few of these other guys normal guys hey it's just like you and i and they, they're guys who were unfortunately put into this situation for some of the very same reasons that the competitors were yeah you know uh, richard what i found interesting about how the show used this concept is that the minute that that abstraction is removed and you see the person underneath the mask 90 percent of the time they kill that person off uh because as soon as that mask is lifted all the mystery is gone all the threats gone and the only one who got away with that was the front man. Um, but I think that's because they have plans for him down the line. But I just found it interesting how they utilize this concept. And they, they've created such an iconic look that whenever you see someone with that mask and that circle or triangle or like whatever, you instantly know they're from Squid Games. So how can storytellers use this concept in their own stuff to make something just as iconic? Well, it's um, you, one, one thing about use of color. Is you you see all the the people like the, the the pink or the red color that the the the, the, the staff was wearing, it, it's on the opposite end side of the color wheel that the, from the green jumpsuits everyone else is wearing. So it, you know if you're writing a story, you know it's a little harder for the the readers to to appreciate that. But if it's on it's something visual like on a screenplay, you can set up you know uh, opposition real easy just with color. And one thing when it comes to abstraction, if you look at where all the places where the games are taking place, they're hyper realized. They're like an, a, an old, uh, or rather, it's a playground, or it's like this great big set with cranes and everything. And, and that's an actual all in, in the C. Escher uh, yeah. painting. And it, it's, it's all, you know, when you're in there, you realize that this is the game that you're in, and this is where a lot of life and death is. And what was brilliant is every time the characters are put into that sort of situation, you know, here comes the tension because this is the life and death place. And there was not a lot of, wasn't too much violence outside in the real world. But when they get in there and you're, you're in that first red light, green light game where they're surrounded by the, oh, it looks like we're in a little field and there's the giant doll that's turning around and then people start getting shot in the head. And I think just that, you know, um, putting that, the, going to that level of detail with the set design and the abstraction of you are now in the game world where all the violence happens versus you come back to the real world where all the consequences are. And you know the, the the you know dealing with your actions, and I thought you know being able to kind of give that threshold for the for the audience and for the actors was really just brilliant. And so when it comes down for you as the writer out there, is okay. How do you or how are you going to push your characters into some place where you can kind of cheat and up the drama by putting them in that kind of situation? Like the part where they're 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 doing the honeycomb game. Mm -hmm. It's like they're just. Just using a needle on a honeycomb game, but I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm watching like this the whole time. And I'm like, this is, I, mean, I, I caught myself like, this is brilliant. I'm just doing this thing. And I can't believe how into this scene I am because it was color, it was uh, stakes, it was everything was, was just, you know, firing on all cylinders right there. So, you know, for, for all, everyone out there who's thinking about writing or, or performing stories, it's just like, you know, you've got some free real estate out there. It can't just be words and actions. Use the set, use the environment to sort of up you know, uh, up the stakes. And if you've got a battlefield, have a spaceship crash. Why not? Have something blow up out of the ground. Giant lizards. Who cares? You know, just, just keep going with it. So, uh, Chris, you know, there's this old concept in storytelling that what you don't see is far more scary than what you do see. Um, and I think that they really utilize this. I mean, you and I are both anti-maskers. We don't like masks. But I think that the use of masks in this show uh, is an exception to the rule because, yeah. you know, the, the mask that they had for the front man was very distinct from all the other masks and it made him an imposing figure and, and threatening in, in a weird way. And all like the, uh, the worker bees who had like the, the black masks with the symbols on them, um, you, you know, like once you learn like 
the hierarchy of that where the triangles were like the soldiers and the circles were like the janitors and the uh, squares were like the, the supervisors. Uh, and, and you started to kind of like get a sense of like what was lurking underneath those masks in terms of like the hierarchy. It became a very fascinating aspect of the world building that, that we got sucked into. So how do you think uh, people can use this concept of, you know, characters and masks and, you know, world building through um, revealing uh, th these abstractions in order to enhance storytelling. Well, this is a, this is not a good example. This show of using abstraction in storytelling, and the reason is because this was done in a very unique way, and and I think that it was very smart and very well done. But it's going to be you, 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 this is not something that can be applied broadly, because this is a show within a show, right? So you have the, sh the show and th the world of the show is actually the real world, right? They're, they're showing real South Korea, you know, very naturalistic, real people that you might find in South Korea. And then they go onto this island where all this like surreal, crazy shit happens, right? And this is, and the reason they have the masks and, and all this kind of stuff, I mean, there's reason for it that they create in the show that makes total sense, right? Um, but it's also, you know, there's a secondary reason why they make it so stylized, which is that, you know, the anonymity is what I was trying to get at there. The anonymity is the reason that people wear masks in the show. But the reason they make it so stylized is because they're doing it for the benefit of these wealthy benefactors who, you know, they're charging a fee from these guys, I assume, to some, you know, to some extent. But then they're also obviously giving money to one of the contestants and... It's to some degree for the enjoyment of these rich assholes. And, um, and that is, that's a very surreal thing that you, unless you had a very, very similar concept to this show, you wouldn't be able to utilize it that much. <clears throat> a more, um, okay, my wife well, is taking Well, you know, away. Star Wars used yeah, the same the, concept, the... right? Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers. Well, they, that wasn't a show within a show. No, it wasn't. It, wasn't like, I mean, it was I like mean, Luke, Luke, Luke was like, let's get, got kidnapped and dragged into this show where he had to deal with Darth it, Vader. It, it's, and the it's that concept of abstraction where like we don't know no, no, what no. Darth Vader well, looks it's, like. So that's we where don't I was know going. What the right. look like. Well, so that's where I was kind of getting into. Oh, you're saying that? I don't know if the word abstraction is 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 the best for that. But I was I would say this. So what? That's where I was going to go. I was going to go to Star Wars and James Bond. All right, because Star Wars uh, is a science fiction. Uh, film series in which you know you're you're in a galaxy far far away a long time ago and you can kind of do anything you want and you want to do something that looks pretty fantastical and also superhero movies you kind of want to do the same thing um but i think james bond is is probably the best version of this where you have a fairly naturalistic character in a fairly naturalistic world you know he james bond is supposed to be set in our world right and it's just all these kind of like crazy things are happening. You know, he's involved in these crazy things. And then oftentimes you have a very weird villain with some kind of deformity or wears some kind of mask or has some kind of, you know, quirky thing about him. And not every James Bond movie pulls that off in a naturalistic way. <laughs> but occasionally you, you'll see a character that has some kind of weird quirk and you know, actually works pretty well. It, it seems pretty natural. I think the problem that you run into with writing something like a Star Wars or writing something like a James Bond or writing something in which you do have... You know, I think there is a tendency for writers to want to create something like a mask or some stylistic, you know, um, visually interesting thing. Um, the problem that you run into sometimes is that that can come across as very campy or very cheesy. And so you, you, you really have to ground everything you do in, re, in as much in reality as you can. I think they did, you know, obviously that was done very well in Star Wars. That was done very well in some of the James Bond films. <laughs> and the only other place that I see, you know, getting, getting a little bit, I think, more toward where, where you guys are talking about, where you're, try, where you're trying to go with this, you know, the idea of covering somebody's face or... or or doing something in such a way where you're creating a mystery or whatever, I think the best place that that tends to be employed the most m most often is horror films, right? You have a lot of horror films in which 
you don't really know what the villain looks like because he's wearing some kind of grotesque mask or something like that. Um, and then, of course, in the case of Jaws, you don't see the shark for a, a pretty significant portion of the film, and you want to know what that damn shark looks like. Uh, but then the risk of that is, if you ever do reveal it and, it, and it's not quite as terrifying as the audience imagined, then you're in trouble. We've discussed that before, I think. And, uh, and Jaws obviously did that very well. The, the shark was somewhat terrifying. Yeah. And uh, some, some really great films do it very well. That, that yeah, you, you know, on our episode where we talked about mystery boxes. Yeah, mystery um, boxes. That's like, right. That's like, right. like the, the idea that you can't, you don't know what these people look like. Therefore, uh, they're far more menacing. And the minute that you exactly. realize what they look like, all their powers kind of rob from them. And, and so like this concept of abstraction, which, you know, maybe it's not the best term for it. My, my term uh, in, in utilizing it, 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 it's more about obstruction of uh, the creation of mystery through obstruction yeah. so like like you know um that that that's kind of like my definition of abstraction it might not be the best word for it but that's what i used i didn't he, quite catch on to what you were saying until i was halfway through my thought but you know, yeah i mean i mean um, creating but, a mystery through a mask i think is is a fine thing to do but like i said it's risky if you don't do it well yeah i well, mean ab ab abstraction is all about creating the mystery of the show and real quick um that kind of brings us to our next talking point, which is the insurmountable obstacle. Now, Steve, when Squid Games puts its characters in situations where the audience doesn't know how they're going to make it through the deadly obstacle that they are facing, um, you have this great kind of like audience moment where they're like, how are they going to get out of this one? You know, it's like life and death. And the nature of the obstacle is such that like this character is obviously going to die. How are they going to get out of this? So it creates a lot of drama and tension. So what I wanted to ask you was, how do storytellers craft situations like these where it's unique in the sense that like, oh, I don't know how this character is going to survive this. But then when they do, it's totally believable and completely satisfying. The best example of this is that honeycomb challenge where you're like, I don't know how, you know, four, five, six is going to get out of this. And then he figures out like a really unique solution to it by licking the back and softening up the, the sugar that's holding the cookie together. So he's able to get the umbrella out of the cookie. So like as a storyteller, as a writer, what can storytellers do to create situations like that and make them believable? I think the first thing to do is to understand what you're dealing with. Um, in the case of the cookie, you're dealing with a cookie. And what, what does this honeycomb cookie do? If you lick it, it will. And know what, you know that going in as a solution versus you know the other unique ways of doing it you know, the girl uh, crazy chick had the lighter and she's light you know, heating it up so it popped out really easy but knowing when you go in having it set up but being very careful to make it not obvious i think that's that's the tough part because hey you know they fooled me i didn't think think for a second licking the honeycomb would work but it was very original very creative another way was um they did it was in the tug of war it's like, oh God, we're gonna get killed. I mean, these guys, these are all guys here, and we've got a crazy woman, an old man, but the old man coming up with the story and an idea. And you know what? He, what he told them was actually legitimate. Uh, I mean, I could tell a story years ago. Long story short, I was in a tug of war, and a guy had a great idea. Let's get all the little guys on the line. So we had one extra guy pulling on the rope. We won because of the, basically it's the same concept having some uh, Deus Ex Machina almost in the, in the old man, but it was not quite that because we didn't know at the time he was a ringer. So it just so happened to be fortuitous that we, we saw it in the case of the cookie. It was like uh, ingenuity. Uh, and I wouldn't have thought to lick it. Uh, it, it, I think the key is is taking your time to create this scenario. Okay, yes, I know I have a cookie here, but, or you know, honeycomb cookie. If I lick it, it will melt. Saliva melts it. Looking at your motif, what can break this thing down in a way that's not going to destroy it? What is going to allow someone, a group of people who are obviously physically weaker, to defeat another group of people in a game of strength? Uh, and come up with, I think the best thing is to come up with the, the scenario first or the solution first and then build around that and very carefully layering it to where we're not going to see it coming. That's an excellent point. Like 
cr create the solution before you create the insurmountable obstacle. Right. Richard, a lot of like the, the biggest pitfall for story writers and storytellers when it comes to insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles is the deus ex machina, where like the solution just comes out of left field. There's no setup for it. So how do storytellers avoid that pitfall? You know, it's, um, I, I think Steve is absolutely right that you know your solution before you go in. And then also, if, if you see something like you're going to have this big problem and you know the solution, but if you don't want it to seem like a deus ex machina, you give some hints along the way. And you know, like when they're going up in the elevator and the old man says, here's how you do it. That was a, that was a little, I was a little iffy right there. But you know, but, but if you think, well, this is an old guy. He's been around a long time. It kind of makes sense that he wouldn't know how to do that. So what you do, just you just give hints. You know, if somebody's, you know, uh, you have one character who's good at math. Like we had that one uh, character in the show who said he was a math teacher, and then he gets to the end where he's got he's got a, he's the front of the line for the the glass uh, challenge. And he does the math in his head, and he's like, I got a one in thirty two thousand chance of doing this. And he just goes, and because he realizes he's kind of screwed there. And then, but also like, you know, they had the one character in that same challenge who said, oh, I used to work in a glass factory. And it's like, oh, now you tell us. And even the, even the, it was good because they had the front man go, oh, geez, that's been in the books the whole time. I never even noticed that. Oops. You know, that, that's a little bit of a cheat from the right away. But what was good is that, you know, they, they think, oh, the, re the audience thinks, oh, we've got the guy who knows glass. They're going to sail through it. But then it ends up, he just it gets lucky that he can't figure it out at the end. And then they. They, they use him to figure out which one was uh, the, the the correct glass or not. So I mean that, that's a little bit of a red herring there. But so what you need is you kind of have to, you know, condition the audience to know, hey, you know, this guy knows a lot about math, and he uses his math skills once or twice, and then later on it's like, oh, I use my math skills. I'm like I hate to break it up, but uh, uh, what was it Harry Potter? You know, in the first book, we know how smart Hermione is. And then they get to the, the one challenge where she's got to do something with three cups or whatever it was. And she just says, here's the answer. And everyone just kind of goes along with it because they don't want to, you know, waste time trying to figure it out. And when it accepts that Hermione was smart enough to figure out the answer to that, and they just kept on going. So, you know, it's uh, Steve's absolutely right. Know your solution before you get there. And then to make sure the audience doesn't think you're being cheap, you, you, you know, hint that people are going to know this answer along the way. Yeah, like the, the, the big issue with, uh, insurmountable obstacles is the, really the setup. If you have a good setup that reveals the obstacle as being like, oh shit, um, that makes it when the character comes up with the solution so much more satisfying. If you look at the structure of each of these games in Squid Games, there's always a build up to it. Like you don't know what it is. And then like when it's revealed, you're kind of like, oh, what's the stakes here? And then the stakes are established then it's revealed like, oh, the characters are at a disadvantage and now they have to figure out a way to overcome that. Now, Chris, it's not that I don't want to hear your answer to this and you can answer it if you want to, but I actually want to ask you about our next discussion point because you and I had a big, long conversation about this after we both watched the show and I wanted you to have time to share it with uh, the audience because you have a lot of good ideas. And that's the non-preachy use of themes. So Squid Games has deeply relevant themes that are layered into it, but they don't do it in a preachy way like the typical American production would. Um, basically, there are themes of like class warfare, equality, humanism, anti-capitalism, and even pro-capitalism. And they're all present in the show, but they never, they're never like in your face. They're there, but like you have to be looking for them. So how can storytellers layer themes and social messages into their stories the right way if they so desire? <laughs> to, to comment on what Richard and Steve just said uh, before I get into this uh, actually what you guys said is perfect I, I don't really even have much to add except to say that uh, this is actually how you write an ending to a story right uh, you, you write an ending to a story by you know if you have a framework you have a villain or you know you kind of have some idea of what the story is you will want to know where you're going before you start the story right and, and that way you can like Richard said pepper things in throughout the story and, you know, Squid Game is a lot of little stories within a bigger story, right? Every game has to have a conclusion. So once you figured out what games you wanted to use, you know, you figured out, okay, how is the hero going to get through this? You know, how is maybe some of the other characters going to get through this? All right, now how do I create a dramatic story that 
winds its way to that ending. And, um, and so there's a, it's basically like a bunch of little stories in the bigger story. But it's, it's almost a master class in writing endings because you got to end every, you know, you got to end every little story and you got to end the whole show. And, and, you know, that was, it was all done brilliantly. Um, with regard to the, the themes uh, problem, yeah, this is what I was mentioning earlier. On Twitter, uh, there's a, a large community of socialists right now talking about how um, you know, Squid Game is an anti-capitalist film. And the, the writer of Squid Game, I don't know if he was prompted to say this by the variety. Um, the variety is a, what they call one of the trades here in Hollywood. And they interviewed him, uh, the, the, the writer-director. And in that interview, he apparently says that, um, you know, this is a, a metaphor for capitalism, this show. Because it's com competitive and, you know, one person wins and at the expense of all these other people. Of course, that's not how capitalism works, but whatever. Anyway, um, I don't know if he was prompted to say that or if, if that was really true. Uh, but so all these socialists have come on and said, look, capitalism doesn't work. Squid Games proves it, essentially. Like, you know, Squid Games is going to cause an anti-capitalist revolt and all these kinds of things. But Squid Games does, isn't really anti-capitalist. It may be a critique of capitalism in some way, you know, in some ways about, you know, poor people, rich people, whatever. But it's not really anti-capitalist. And I, I would say that, and, and Richard could, could maybe talk about this a little bit, but I would say that I'm not sure South Koreans are deeply fond of communism. I mean, there is, <laughs> there's a little, if you know anything about history, okay, uh, there was a little thing in the 1950s called the Korean War. <laughs> right. And there was two sides to this war. And you might think it was the North Koreans and the South Koreans. It wasn't. It was the Russians and it was the Americans. It was a proxy war, right? And... The North Koreans and the South Koreans were the, you know, proxy states that were fighting, and we, you know, it ended up in a something like a draw, and North Korea ended up communism, and South Korea ended up uh, capitalist. And, and we can see how that turned out. You know, North Korea isn't a place that people typically go on holiday. South Korea is fucking amazing. Richard, you want to say something? You can see the difference from space at night. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Can, it's absolutely true. You can see the difference from space at night. It's mental the immense wealth and like and honest and this guy talks about in his interviews the writer director whose name i can't, can't pronounce so i'm not going to try he 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 actually grew up in a slum like the like the main characters in the film and like the um the guy who uh, the stock trader he was really smart and was expected to be very successful and he went into the film industry and now he is incredibly successful. Uh, he, through capitalism, right? Capitalism produced the cameras that he used, produced the internet, produced the TVs we watched the, you know, the show on, and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, capitalism facilitated this guy's immense success in life. Now, the great thing about what this guy did is, even if it was a critique of capitalism, I'm great with that, because even though I'm a pro-capitalist, I think we should have some criticism of capitalism. I think we should have that discourse. Um, and I think that if there is a critique of capitalism in this show, which I don't really see, but if there is, um, fine. You know, if people see that in it, I think that's good. And, you know, but at the end of the day, there was no message in this TV show or this series that I could identify that in any way detracted from the entertainment of the show, right? Um, there are just some, you know, I'm trying to think of a, a film or a TV show like from the 80s that had a real strong moral message. Because when I was growing up watching Indiana Jones and Back to the Future and Superman and all these kinds of films and, and TV shows and stuff, I, I don't really remember political messages. I remember some moral messages like, you know, be a good person and stuff like that. I even, you know, Captain Planet was pretty obviously political, but we didn't care because it was just about a superhero and a bunch of super kids running around trying to save the day. And we were just like, yeah, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it was like, there's a bad thing happening. Something has to be done to fix that bad thing. Bad thing fixed. Everybody's happy at the end of the day. And like with these Korean projects, it's like, Okay, let's create a brilliant, entertaining story. If there's a little bit of a message in there, that's great. But 
in America right now, we've gotten to the point where we corrupt the entertainment value of the project in favor of this political messaging. And that, you know, I, like, look, it doesn't matter to me. You could, your whole project could be a political message. Your, your whole project could be, you know, trying to convert people to the Church of Latter-day Saints. I do not care. You could, it could be an atheist thing. It could be, you know, a satanic thing might be a little too far, but... You know, basically, any message you want to put in a movie, I'm fine with, as long as that movie is a good movie. If it's a good story, I'm going to watch it, you know? I think we can all agree with that. Richard, yeah. what did you think of, of these themes? You know, one of the aspects of this show that really stood out to me is that when they uncovered the uh, s subplot of, like, the organ harvesters and that they were, like, kind of rigging the game by letting some of the contestants know what the next game was... Uh, the front man comes out and he, he's like, you've corrupted the very essence of this game. Everyone's supposed to have an equal shot, an equal opportunity to win because they're, they've are they had an unfair um, like uh, disadvantage their entire lives. And this is meant to actually give them a chance on the level playing field. And I thought that that was a really interesting kind of like way of looking uh, at things from the bad guy's perspective. So what did you think about the themes in this show and how... As a writer, would you recommend other storytellers layer in themes that don't turn the audience off? Yeah, I think uh, really good art. Uh, if you you have five people look at it, five people will give you five different opinions. And if you're doing it, if the story comes across that way, you've done a pretty good job. It's really when writers get to the point where you have someone specifically say exactly what the writer wants to say and then ends it with like, you need to do better, Senator. You know that sort of moment. You're you're, you're kind of Cap you're, Captain Do Better. Yeah, if you're you're, you're putting it on your sleeve, you're failing the audience because now you're preaching, and then everyone in the audience is like, "Oh my gosh, I'm just here to be entertained. Now I have to do better." So people, you know, that kind of writing, pretty poor. But when it comes to of course, um, layering in themes, like for me, Squid Game, I was really into how the uber rich, these people who are so bored, that they they come up with this game where they're you know, killing people, and they treat all the lower classes like horses. He actually said, "You're a horse." In that, and like that kind of thing was like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, this the dehumanization of other humans. I think that was one thing that I was, I was, you know, I kind of glommed onto that, and I was interested in that. But you know, when it comes to for writers out there who, are, how do you do this without upsetting your audience? We well, you know, is you your themes are con you know what your themes are when you write this, but if you make it too obvious. Then you're 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 failing, and all, if ever you want to have two characters have a discuss you know have a discussion about it, just have people disagree about whatever thing that you just brought up. Like someone you want to have people to start thinking about religion and the Crusades. And my three year olds here, and you could just say you know you have characters talk about the. Thank you. You have characters talk about the Crusades and how you know, and then you let kind of you get down to the point where. You let the reader make up their own mind. Okay, hold on, Nathan. When characters disagree, then that le that leaves the audience the chance to agree with one of the other characters, and they don't feel like they're being forced into thinking something. So yeah. that's that, that's a, a little cheat I've used is when something comes up and the character's like, I don't agree with that. You know, that's my way of saying letting the readers kind of have an out from thinking that I'm preaching to them. So, Steve, um, one of the more interesting aspects of, of this show came at the end where, you know, uh, we're going to talk about the big twist ending in our last uh, discussion point segment. But um, the guy behind the games basically says, like, the, the super poor and the super rich both share a, a common problem. And that is that life is hard. Like, if you have too much money, you have a whole different set of problems from people who have no money. But it's no less hard uh, being uber wealthy than it is being uber poor. And, uh, you know, uh, they kind of talk. Uh, I, I feel like the main theme of the Squid Games is kind of like class classism, like, like you know, lower class versus upper class. And the old man who was kind of like behind everything, if you if you go back and you rewatch the show at every step of the way, he's giving people a choice. It's like you can either play the game or you don't have to play. You can go back to your life. And the people, because of their circumstances, choose to play the game. Uh, so what do you think was like the primary theme of, of this show and why did it work so well? 
Well, I think you you spoke into it. It's um, it's it comes it, it, what it really comes down to to. I feel like in the case of Jihan is value and value as a person. Um, he had no purpose until the very last scene of that movie. Now, this is a guy who's basically a drain on everyone around him. He's a, an ass and he goes to this moral beat down with throughout the series. But at the end, he's stepping onto that plane. He looks back and he sees the guy playing the j uh, jockey or whatever it's called, the, you know, the, the slap thing. It's like, I'm going to stop him. They tell him, don't do it. So he got the money and his life was empty. When he saw that, he's like, now I have some purpose to live. His, he, his life could be fulfilled. So to me, that's what seemed like to be the main theme. Um, I think a lot of the other stuff that, uh, that, um, that Chris and Richard talked about was so powerful is, you know, the, the thematic elements, why they, how they didn't become preachy was because we were seeing a, you know, this speaks into what Richard was saying. We were seeing a, pers uh, a point of view. Of a character now they can say oh well it's anti-capitalism it's like no you're seeing it from one person's point of view in this story uh a very good example of this is the original watchman story the the comic book in the movie uh not this nonsense it's uh that hbo has been cranking out the last uh you know this last go around each of these characters you had a hardcore uh libertarian in Rorschach. You had a socialist billionaire in Ozymandias. You had people right in between all of them, uh, you know, uh, an opportunist. This is a, the same type of thing, but a lot more subtly done. They, everyone's got their, their sob story. Everyone's got their fingered point. But in the end, I think the, that's where the whole point with Jihan rises up. I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose this. This is my purpose. This is what I'm committed to. And I think it's uh, it's be committed to your family, be committed to whatever your purpose is. And uh, I think that was to me, that was the main theme. I mean, it's there was class warfare for sure. But I think the resolution of it was elevate beyond that and bis have a function and a purpose. You know what? All that all that shit goes away. You're not going to be dealing with it. And um, to, to answer, uh, Chris, you mentioned that, you know, you don't remember any movie. Um, did you ever, uh, in the 80s, that was preachy, did you ever see an Oliver Stone film? No, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't. I've oh, thank God, yeah. Film. Well, for, for, for you writers out there, the uh, way to um, write a theme in a movie is watching the Oliver Stone movie and do the opposite. Because he takes it, his points and he beats you over the head with them. Every five minutes, you're going to be reminded, yes, your government is bad and you should be very ashamed and feel terrible about it. So the one of the keys is, is to layer it. Be subtle. Layer it as much as you can and then go up underneath it and just present it as an, uh, an opinion, as an option. But someone someone will come along and say, I, I identify with that. And that's that's great audience identification. All right, guys, so um, let's get on to our final topic for the night, which is plot twist and twist ending. So like uh, the big plot twist at the end of this uh, series was that uh, the old man who had been part of the game, you know, throughout about 60% of the show um, was revealed to be the host, the guy behind the games. And uh, he kind of calls in, uh, you know, 456 to his deathbed. And they make like a, a final bet. They play a final game. Uh, to, to see like, you know, the, the quality of humanity. And it was kind of an interesting twist at the end there. And, and if you go back and you watch it, there are all these clues that, you know, the, the, that old man was, was a bit of a ringer. Um, so it, it was very well set up. But, um, you know, this show was really good at keeping the audience on the edge of their seat with a lot of plot twists uh, and that huge twist at the end. So what I want to know is how can writers properly set up a good twist ending and how can they properly play uh, with audience expectations without upsetting the audience? Uh, Richard, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief because I know we're running out of time. It, it's, it's, if you're going to have a twist ending, you need to make your audience not feel like an idiot when it comes out. And you need to have enough little clues along the way so that when, as soon as you hit that twist, the, re the reader or audience is immediately going to go, wait, 
why didn't I realize that? And they're going to replay the whole thing and they're going to stop and go, oh, 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 oh. If you do it that way, you've done it very well. I mean, the, the most classic twist ending out there with uh, Sixth Sense. You know, the, what's his name? Shyamalama Ding Dong actually has a replay. He actually, like, replays parts of the movies where he's like, this is where you should have noticed it. You know, that's kind of treating your audience like an idiot is when they, if you do the replay, it show exactly where it is. But, it, but uh, so just keep in mind that you can't cheat your, your audience like that. But just, ooh, what the twist? No, you need to have an actual... Show it along the way. No the twist should only be how does it? It should only be a surprise to the people who are paying attention to the story right now. So, but like, and if like if people are stopping and examining every single thing like a mystery, then they're probably going to figure it out. So don't treat your story like a mystery and have a twist. So, if that makes any sense, it it, it does. And one of the mistakes a lot of storytellers make is they think that if someone figures out their twist then that's a bad thing. But there's a certain amount of audience satisfaction that comes from figuring it out and, and being proven right. And you're like, oh, I'm smart too. Steve, what do you think is the key to not only creating a good twist ending, but also good plot twists? Um, I think when the when the hints are put out there, the, oh, you should have seen that, like uh, Richard was talking about, have it have another possible meaning. Uh, we see something, uh, uh, the, the greatest example, if you guys have ever seen the, Ode uh, the Odessa file, there's probably the greatest twist of all time. And Fantastic it was, film as well. oh God, amazing film. I don't want to, I, I feel, I kind of hesitate to give it away because it's so brilliant, but we see something that is, it, the audience, everyone is fooled. It looks like it's supposed to be one thing. And it's like, who was this guy? And you shot this man. Who was it? Boom. And you find out, oh, God, that was that's why this guy was on this trail the whole time. Uh, something so subtly hidden. I mean, uh, OK, Richard, uh, Matt, did you guys see the movie, The Odessa Phone? Watch it. It's absolutely brilliant. John Boyd. I want to uh, rewatch it. Yeah, I'm going to. I probably will now, too. It's uh, but that was a great example. It's, uh, you know, we we didn't. Knowing what we know, and that's that's the easy part. We can go back and look, but we saw the old man, and we're like, "Oh my God, he's gonna die!" And it's kind of like I, I was almost rationalized in his mind. Well, he has cancer; he's gonna die anyway. You know what? It's kind of cool. He let Jihan go, but <laughs> now he did this. That was that was that was smart. That was a great twist. And I think, um, like I said, the other one, you, Matt, you you mentioned, uh, you know, figuring it out. I figured out about five minutes before that. You know, with the uh, the police, young police officer, that was his brother. I mean, I'm sure there's people who figured out instantly. You know, he was the winner, and so he was probably involved in it. I mean, it's still a great twist. Um, so that was a, a, a plot twist that I'm not sure what it's going to lead to. I mean, if there's a possible sequel here, but yeah, if you if you take um, take it, have a different a, a different alternate meaning or multiple alternate meanings. What does this mean? when I see something and have it subtle so the audience may not even look at it or it may just in passing. Um, uh, another, you know, sometimes it can be a cheap cop out, uh, even though it could, it could still be good, but it feels like a cheap cop out when you see it. Uh, a good example was um, the Roger Avery movie. It was uh, done. I'm trying to think of this movie it was um, the name of it. Um, Rules of Attraction with, um, with James Vanderbeek and, there was he kept getting these notes sent to him saying and it's from this girl they just passed the camera over her now it was effective she was there and if you go back and watch yeah they did show her but man they really didn't see that that's kind of like oops i wanted to be this this subtle and it was too subtle so you have to give them something mm -hmm. at some point in time you don't have to hit them over the head with it you know oliver stone style but you have to give them something at the same time that something's got to have more than one meaning or more than one possibility when they're seeing it. All right. Now, uh, Chris, I know that your big thing is the Twilight Zone, and those were known for their big twist endings. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this? How do you craft a truly fantastic twist? Well, I love the point that you made, which is that um, you, you really don't need to fool everybody in the, in the audience. Uh, you know, you, you, you want to strike a balance. I, I don't know what that balance is. Maybe it's 2080. Maybe it's 
you know, 397. I'm not really sure how many people should be figuring out your, your, your plot twists uh, or your endings. Um, <clears throat> but when Steve was talking about the licking of the, um, the cookie, uh, you know, when, when this show, one thing that's brilliant about this show is, you, you know, at, right after the red light, green light, you're, as an audience member, at least I was trying to figure out how to beat each game. Right, while I was watching this, this show. And so when they did the cookie one, I literally turned to my wife and I go, can you spit on it? <laughs> and my thought, if you could spit maybe a little bit on the needle thing and then wet the, the, the grooves, that might help a little or something like that, right? And then the guy starts licking the back and I'm like, you can spit on it! <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and that, you know, and, and, I, and I figured out the old man real quick, uh, which, okay, Look, full disclosure, very, very few people are going to figure out the old man thing. I think one person in the comments said that he figured it out uh, after the marbles, right? Because they didn't show him die, right? When you, have a, when you have a movie where you literally show every single person die, and then one person you don't show die, it kind of gives the game away. They probably should have made a few other characters hidden deaths as well. But um, just because that's how I would have written it with the old man running the show, right? That, that, because I write twist endings, that, that to me made sense, okay? So I thought of that pretty early on. But very few people are going to think of that early on. However, I think that it's something that, you know, I don't know if everybody or a huge number of people are going to get the licking the back of the cookie or, or putting spit on it or something like that. But it's something you can get. It's something that you can think of. But what's great about it is that you go... I thought of that, you know, and, and the roller coaster is maybe a little bit different than the person that says, genius, you know, but it's still a roller coaster. It's still a hell of a lot of fun. And, and I would say that when Richard said, you don't want the audience to feel like an idiot, um, you, you kind of do, you kind of do not, not like, not like bad about themselves, but sort of like a magic trick, right? Yeah, like, if why I did see, I see that coming? Exactly. If I see a really good magic trick and I go, how did he do that? <laughs> I feel a little bit like an idiot because I don't know how he did it. But I'm like, I still love to watch it. I kind of like to be tricked, right? I like that this guy has the ability to do something that I can't figure out how it was done. Uh, and I think that that's, that is something that is so profound about writing that people don't understand. Like I think that some writers don't. I think writers want to feel like they're, you know, or want to create something that that makes them feel smart in the audience sometimes, but they don't get that that's not really what you're trying. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about some writers doing that, but I think that writers should be writing stuff that takes the audience on a ride. And in order to do that, you do have to kind of trick them sometimes and do things that they don't necessarily expect. But as Richard was saying, which was totally spot on, you know, you do need to give them hints. You do need to create... You do, you do, like, like you said, like, you know, they, they want to be able to watch the film and go, oh, 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 okay. You know, as they think back and they, and they watch the film and get it in their head, yeah. you know. Good, good twists are always believable, but unforeseen. Yeah, and so. I think Richard and Steve kind of together early on when they were talking about uh, the, the individual games, like I, like I already said, they, they really illustrated how to write a great ending, which is... You first, you, before you actually write the first line of the movie or the book or, or the TV show, you write the ending first, and then you have something, excuse me, then you have something to write to. And we talked about this in a previous episode, but, you know, you want your ending to be satisfying. You know, in, in the 90s, people were really against writing happy endings. <laughs> writing a happy ending was like anathema. Nobody wanted to write a, a happy ending. Now you will see happy endings in stories a lot more. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if your story is a happy ending or a sad ending, just so long as it's a satisfying uh, uh, ending and the audience leaves going, I feel like my life is better because I watched this movie. Now, and so if a, an audience I, walks away thinking, I feel like my life is uglier or worse, or I feel stupider for watching this film, uh, you didn't do a good job. Yeah. Like, and you speaking need to have improved speaking of endings, we've come to the end of this right. live stream. Uh, I want to thank my expert panel so much for coming on and sharing their insights on this. I hope everyone in the chat enjoyed it. Uh, Richard, uh, where can people find out more about you if they want to check out your books and uh, what projects are you working on? 
Hey, uh, first place I say go is go to Amazon.com, type into Richard Fox, and you will see uh, The Ember War, you'll see The Exile Fleet, you'll see The Tear, you'll see my book, Dave Weber. Uh, start there. If not, or, or go to Facebook, type in Richard Fox Author. Boom. Come on over. Uh, take a seat. Stay a while. And I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for, for staying uh, staying uh, in this whole thing as I ramble for ever and ever, just like I'm doing right, right now. I always appreciate you coming on uh, the show, Richard. You're a truly fantastic author. We're very privileged to have you here. Uh, Steve, why don't you uh, sign off for us and let everyone know uh, where they can find you on social media or if they don't? Oh, I'm pretty much hidden. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I don't really participate right now in uh in uh in, in a whole lot of writing I, I haven't been doing a whole lot since i've been i've moved back to texas with family and been working on uh, other projects but um yeah i may get back into it soon one thing to check out is locally we have a lot of stuff going on this is really interesting movies coming out of this uh city amarillo from a company called sharpened iron i'm gonna talk to them see what we can i can come up with for them so who knows maybe you'll see something from me in the future that's fantastic. And Chris, where can people hear you, uh, you know, talk about politics? Uh, yeah, I'm Mr. Reagan on YouTube. So if you want to hear me rant about uh, how stupid Joe Biden is and how, <laughs> uh, you know, how we need to bring sensibility back to the country, you can watch my Mr. Reagan show. Uh, it used to be fairly popular until YouTube decided to crush me. I also have another channel called Mr. Pagan. Uh, which I did as a kind of parody uh, account, so that's all comedy stuff. And uh, I will be doing a video actually about uh, Squid Games coming up here on my Mr. Reagan channel, and then I'm going to be doing a video about how the FBI wants to uh, create a, um, you know, they, they want your uh, mom or your wife to be listed as a terrorist if she goes to a school board meeting for my Mr. Pagan channel. So that's going to be a lot of fun. It sounds fun. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, next week, we're going to have another bad writing episode. So be sure to check back in. Uh, I don't know what the topic's going to be yet or who uh, is going to be joining me on the panel, but I guarantee you that they're going to be awesome. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Uh, if you're watching this on a replay, be sure to leave us a super thanks. If you have any questions you want to ask, uh, we always are 100% sure to respond to uh, super thanks. And thank you everyone who donated super chats during the discussion. We really appreciate the support of the channel. And if you wanna get more uh, exclusive live streams, be sure to check out saltynerdclub.com. That's our members area where we give you four exclusive podcasts every month and lots of other goodies. Thank you all so much. This is Matthew Kadish saying, <laughs>